Happy New Year to you. Happy New Year to you. Happy New Year to you. You know who you are, so smile for me now. Happy New Year to you. It's a new me. It's a new you. It's a new year. It's a new me. It's a new you. It's a new year. Happy New Year. You know who you are. If you survive 2020, you are a living legend and a shining star. No matter who you are, this is your great big assignment for this year of 2021. Be great by any means necessary and know that we love you madly. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever thought about your blood flow? said a mumbling word for me one day when i was lost he died upon the cross and i know it was the blood for me he hung his head and died he hung his head and died he hung his head and died for me one day when i was lost he died upon the cross and i know it was the blood for me he's coming back again he's coming back again he's coming back again for me one day when i was lost he died on the cross and i know it was the blood for me 
I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood. I know it was the blood for me. One day when I was lost, he died upon the cross. And I know it was the blood for me. Good evening, boys and girls, scholars and laymen, uh, the wokish and the sleepish, the people and the sheeple. This is I, your brother, Brother Ron, also known as R2C2H2, the artist, coming to you live from We All Be Land. Thank y'all for joining me. And almost bewitching hour, I guess. Um, I have see, I have weird sleeping patterns and stuff like that. I kind of happen to fall asleep by accident a lot of times but rest is very important like baba dick gregory said the three things that are killing people the three things that are killing you it's killing a lot of us is lack of sleep uh lack of exercise and lack of water lack of water lack of sleep lack of exercise this is what killing people you think everything else is killing you but that's what's killing us and we are in purge season right now Seems like 2021 is just a continuous of 2020. Matter of fact, it's like 2021 is like Godfather 2 to uh, 2020 is Godfather 1. You know, Godfather 1 was an instant classic, right? But a lot of people believe that Godfather 2 was even more, was even better or more effective than Godfather 1. In this case, 2021 might be more, even more lethal then 2020 if that's hard to believe because you know 2020 to me is like it was like 2016 on steroids right 2020 was what 2012 was supposed to be as far as the mind doomsday calendar is concerned y'all can look it up take a look it's all online but right now what i'm doing is that um i'm now realizing that i lost a lot of people in 2020 i'm just finding out about people that i lost in 2020 i hope y'all can hear me to make sure everything is uh in working order thank y'all for joining us uh this is a very interesting show we are in interesting times and uh like i said i'm just now finding out about people i lost uh from last year i'm just now finding out about that in the first week of this year I'm just not finding about all about this stuff. I mean, I'm really trying to reassess, man. I'm trying to, I'm really looking at life differently right now for me. I just turned 40 last year. And you tend to notice people passing more so than ever. The older you get, it seems, the more you notice people uh, making their transitions as righteous ancestors or just leaving the planet. And one guy we're going to talk about tonight and pay tribute to is a brother named Patrick Weaver out of DeSoto misery i don't call it missouri or missouri i call it the state of misery and it's like our dear brother patrick was suffering in silence for a long long time and the soto mi mi misery it's about an hour outside of st louis misery i went to school i went to college up in st louis misery that's also where baba dick gregory is from he's from st louis misery he was born there october 12th 1932 up in st louis misery <laughs> So, dear brother Patrick, um, was the founder 
and a host of True Power is Mine, which is on YouTube. He started about two years ago almost. I think about two years ago, this January, he started. Well, maybe it was like three years ago now. Because I think it was January 2018 when he started True Power is Mine. I'm going to share a screen of that, of his uh, YouTube page. Because uh, he was a good brother. He was part of the new black media movement. And also, I guess he was a casualty of sorts of the new black media movement and of just life, you know, just living life. And I'm going to talk about some of that today or tonight or tomorrow. I don't know. It's morning time for like, you know, y'all should check out Two Powers Mind. He was pretty much an innovator. I mean, I was kind of like, wow, this dude really stepped up. He interviewed uh, Mark from Anaheim. If you're familiar with the Carl Nelson show, he did a lot of interviews with Mark from Anaheim, one of uh, Dick Gregory's associates, Mark from Anaheim. If you're familiar with Carl Nelson show, it's kind of like he was an early human warning detector or something like that. Bob Dick Gregory called him because he could really uh, predict things that was coming and that passed. And so, Brother Patrick would actually interview him for hours on end. And also he did some innovative things. Like he did things, for example, like interviewing the Honorable Judge Joe Brown with Mark from Anaheim, which would be like marathon shows, right? Then he also did another brilliant thing of interviewing Judge Joe Brown with Dr. Randy Short. So these are some of your favorites, right? Mark from Anaheim, Dr. Randy Short. Judge Joe Brown and this brother had enough sense to interview these guys, these heavyweights, man. There had to be some courage on his part to do that, you know. And nobody was doing that. He innovated it. I didn't even do that. He did that. And so I got to stop to give pause and praise to this brother because he swore that, you know, he's listened to me for years. Like he used to listen to my shows with Dick Gregory and Baba Dick Gregory, as y'all call him. Uh, Judge Joe Brown, Randy Short. He used to listen to these shows for several years before he started his own platform. So I really pride myself when people tell me, I mean, I'm proud, but it really means a lot that people not only listen to my platform, but by listening to me for a minute, it gives them the courage to step out on their own, to amplify their unique voices, and also uh, be of service to their fellow person or fellow human being. So that means a lot when brothers and sisters come to me and say, well, Brother Ron, I was listening to your show for a long, long time, and I saw what you was doing with Dick Gregory and Judge Joe Brown and Dr. Randy Short and the things you cover on your platform. It just gave me the courage to step out there on faith and do the same thing. So he was one of those brothers like that. So, I mean, he talked to me on the phone back in 2017, and uh, he just told me, you know, he admired me. The work we was doing that we all be and that he was interested in getting the new black media game, which he did. You know, he was very committed. Brother Patrick was very committing. I mean, committed to educating his people, to spreading the good information, to empowering. Because like he said, true power is mine. You have the ability and the power to change the course of your life, to paradigm shift, to be of service to not only yourself, but to other people around you, to be a credit to the human race. And Brother Patrick, in a lot of ways, was a credit, but at the same time, like a lot of us, he was dealing with personal demons. So, uh, yeah, I'm just, man, I, man, I lost classmates. Uh, my aunt died. I have not properly mourned my aunt Stephanie. Um, like, you know, people, like, you know, the people I interviewed, like Reverend C.T. Vivian, Charles Evers, you know, even John Lewis, it's people that, uh, professors, Professor Garrett Duncan from my Washu days, he passed away. I, so many people lost and, uh, I just want to give some space to honor them and I'm going to do my best over the next several days and even months to try to honor these people in a proper way. Um, but I definitely want to get brother Patrick because he was a soldier. He was a universal soldier in this info war. He's a casualty of this info war. It cost him a lot. And, um, I want to share this picture of brother Patrick. This last picture on his Facebook page, on his profile, his profile pic, right? 
share this because it, it says a lot about to me his state of mind in the last days of his life um let me find it and thank y'all for being patient with me really as i'm talking with y'all i'm really trying to work this stuff out in my mind i have a lot of things in my mind i don't know about y'all but my, my my year is already flying off the calendar the days are flying off the calendar for me uh it's going by real fast that's brother patrick weaver man just look at those that the guy's eyes man look at his eyes let me get myself off the screen look at his eyes it says it all they said the eyes are the window windows to the human soul look at that man the last picture that he took, I guess, that was on his Facebook profile. He checked out of here on December 22nd, 2020. And uh, from my understanding, he just had enough and he took himself out of the equation. He was just 48 years young. Like Dr. Rainey Short did a great tribute to this brother on his YouTube channel. Y'all got to check it out. It was brilliant. I think this is the best eulogy he's going to get from anybody, I believe. Because Dr. Short said he could identify with Patrick Weaver because they were both preacher kids. They were both preacher kids. So he could identify with the struggle and with the commitment to trying to be of service to your fellow man. But like Dr. Short says, a lot of times we, we love our traitors but hate our heroes, you know. So... It's a it's a lonely path for a lot of us truth seekers and truth tellers and all that stuff. You don't have a lot of people traveling in your company, but when you do meet a like-minded traveler, you know, you find it that it's an obligation to check in on them from time to time to see how they're doing. And um I post had several interviews with Brother Patrick. He reached out to me over last year to do interviews, and I said, Yeah, I could do them. And nothing never came of them because I didn't know what he was suffering from. I didn't know what he was going through. You know what I'm saying? We all, a lot of us suffer in silence. You understand? And you can just see it in his eyes, man. He's going through a very nasty divorce. I'm not blaming anybody, but I'm saying, think about what just happened to Dr. Dre. He just had a brain aneurysm, dealing with that bitter, nasty divorce with his wife. You know what I'm saying? Uh, that could take a toll on people. I don't think there's such thing as a pretty good breakup. You know, anytime you're dealing with anybody that you share a, a life with, there's going to be some scars, some bruises. Some it's gonna be some hurt, you know. Um, I mean, the man was in a lot of pain. I mean, he got he had four kids that he left behind because of whatever he was dealing with, he just couldn't deal with it no more. So I'm not judging our dear brother Patrick for checking out early. He did what he thought was necessary for him to find some peace of mind. I just hope he is in a place. Of peace and love. I'm hoping for that, brother. But let me read his obituary. And we could talk a little bit more about Brother Patrick. Ah, oh, man. This year is crazy. It is moving extremely fast. Yeah. I, I, I never met him in the flesh. But I remember talking to him several times over the phone. And I just listened to the vibrations in his voice. He seemed like to be a sincere brother. You know what I'm saying? Like, I, I listen to people sometimes. Now how they look is, is um, yeah, he took himself out, Sister Tasha. Yeah, he took himself out. I believe he shot himself. Blew his, uh, blew his head off, from my understanding. Uh, for what I heard. And, uh, actually, he's been cremated. So we don't know what really happened. I just heard that he shot himself, allegedly, at his home. 48 years young, December 22nd, 2020. And uh, life is rough. Uh, man. Yeah, he did a great job of bringing out Mark from Anaheim. He was a real admirer of Mark from Anaheim. Because, you know, anybody know about Mark from Anaheim, you know, he made a lot of appearances on the Carl Nelson show. I don't know if he's doing anything recently, but yeah, Patrick was a big fan and admirer of Mark from Anaheim. So I, I really respect him for not only being a fan, but also um, connecting him with Judge Joe Brown 
and uh doing those shows he did like how he did them shows with judge joe brown and randy short you know they could talk for days man and he was able to handle that on his own so give patrick his props for that give give him his props for that yeah i'm glad y'all yeah give him i mean he can't smell his flowers now but i'm glad that y'all knew that he was somebody that could be trusted with information to bring out information from trusted sources so i just hope that uh his work was not in vain and i'm getting i'm gathering from you all that he was that he did things that were not in vain that he was a true servant of the people and i hope that y'all go to his youtube channel i don't know what his uh wife is going to do i heard that she was deleting videos from his youtube channel so if y'all got something over there that y'all got from uh patrick that was of use to you try to be, try your best to download it it's easy to download youtube videos for your archives because this guy that it, this was his god work and he basically gave his life to try to save people when he couldn't save himself yeah but, you know brother and also he brought jordan maxwell you know a black man giving a platform to somebody like jordan maxwell and jordan maxwell is an interesting fellow man like he's kind of like you know you think about bill cooper or david ike jordan maxwell jordan maxwell i think even claims that he was the one that introduced david ike that's i think it's not a guy named david ike to a north american audience so patrick was really a visionary in his way and how he utilized his media platform i just wish he could have hang around a little bit longer because seasons don't last forever Sometimes it rains and sometimes the sun got to shine. So you're going to go through your ups and downs and ebbs and flow. That's life. That's life. Yeah, and, uh, you know, I would think about that. You hear yes, kids were definitely in the background. You could hear them being children. And some folks didn't like that. I didn't really care too much about that. But now in hindsight, you know, 2020 is hindsight. He took his life in 2020. Now I see that he was just really a family man. He loved his children. And I guess he was hurting so bad. He just, I mean, he just couldn't stick it out for them. It's like he had a, a love for his children. That family meant a lot to him. Family meant a lot to Brother Patrick for what I gather. So it was unfortunate that, that his children would grow up without a father. It's unfortunate. Yes, joy and pain, like sunshine and rain, right? Joy and pain, like sunshine and rain, goes hand in hand. But uh, let me read this obituary for Brother Patrick, and we'll keep it moving. Patrick John Weaver was born on August 21st, 1972, a son to Waverly and Marcella Weaver. He died in DeSoto, Missouri, or Misery, on December 22nd, 2020, at the age of 48. He is survived by his wife, Deborah Sue Weaver of DeSoto, four children, Alexis, Patrick Jr., Emma, and Marcella, one sister, Julie Weaver of Henderson, North Nevada, four brothers, Philip Weaver, Columbia, South Carolina, Mark Weaver, DeSoto, Misery, Kevin Weaver, Arnold, Misery, and Clarence Mason, DeSoto, Misery, and several nieces and nephews. He is preceded in death by his parents and two brothers, Stephen Weaver and Edward Mason. So there's like a little thing on the funeral home website about this brother. I mean, sunrise, August 21st, 1972 sunset december 22nd 2020. now that's interesting timing so he has a black august birthday right 
His birthday is a black August birthday. What happened on August 21st from a historical perspective? Well, he was born, of course, on August 21st, 1972. But also on August 21st, 1970, uh, 1971, you have the state-sponsored uh, assassination of George Jackson, the Soledad brother, right? You know, George Jackson was a field marshal of the uh, Black Panther Party. He was assassinated August 21st, 1971. Also, August 21st, uh, 1791, marks the beginning of the Haitian Revolution. That's August 21st, 1791. Beginning of the Haitian Revolution, and also August 21st, 1971, the state-sponsored assassination of George Jackson, the field marshal for the Black Panther Party at uh, San Quentin, you know. So he's a part of Black August. So he was he had a revolutionary birthday. So he did some revolutionary stuff with the media while he was here in a short period of time because he wasn't doing this for a long period of time. He was in construction labor. I think he had a construction business out there in misery. But for about three years, or almost three years, he was doing new black media work through True Power's Mind, his YouTube channel. So hey everybody. Yep. Yeah, he loved his kid. <laughs> he would he said he would always call them his live studio audience. Yeah, they was probably his biggest fans. I know they're gonna miss their father. But I just want to say this. I had no idea that Patrick was hurting like that. Like I said, he was scheduled like interviews with me. He wanted to do an interview with me. So I said, fine, we could do it. The first interview we did was, uh, you know, dated, I guess, June 9th, 2018 on his YouTube page. Now, that's an interesting day because June 9th is the birthday of uh, Johnny Ace. You know, if y'all follow my Jimmy Lunsford uh, Jamboree Festival series from last month, you know, Johnny Ace took his own life on Christmas night, 1954, doing a concert down in Houston, Texas. So that's interesting. The first time we did an interview on The Morning Show, and I want to shout out his co-host, his partner in crime, Brother Don Big. Br brother Don Big, my amplified condolences and blessings to you, dear brother. Because y'all were road dogs. I mean, as far as I knew, y'all seem like y'all really close, man. And I just want, I don't know how you hurting. I know that's like, probably like your brother from another mother. But I just want to send my condolences to you as well, brother. I hope that you get through this trying time. Because at the time when they were doing the other morning show, his co-host was Dimebag, a brother named Dimebag. So it's like ride or die, I guess. But yeah, it was, I, I thought about that. I said, oh, the first time, he interviewed me was on June 9th of 2018, which is the birthday of Johnny Ace, as well as Jackie Wilson. You know, Jackie Wilson was born June 9th, I believe, 1931. Johnny Ace, born John, um, John Marshall Alexander, I think. <laughs> born June 9th, 1929. So... I believe they said Patrick took himself out with a gun, from my understanding. Yeah, that divorce messed him up. That divorce messed him up. Um, now, you know, Patrick, I mean, he was about you know, empowering black people, but he, you know, his wife was white or is white, or his ex, whatever you want to call it, you know, his kids are mixed. So that's interesting. He was living in rural misery. He was outside of St. Louis. I don't know if y'all have been to misery, <laughs> the state of misery. You know, that's where Dred Scott was told by the Supreme Court of the United States that you nor your descendants have any rights that the white man is bound to respect by law. I actually remember when I was the best man at a wedding for a friend of mine who was a white white man he was marrying a jewish white girl and they had their wedding in st louis they they, they treated me well because he was marrying a, a, a white girl a jewish girl that had money 
her daddy was a medical in the medical profession and ran a business so he had money to spare and um so they, they you know, got me a tailor-made suit of the you know, for be the best man right they flew me up to st louis put me up at the chase park hotel very luxurious hotel in st louis they had their um their nuptials or wedding in the park the st louis artist guild park near washington university where we went to school and washington university is considered the harvard of the midwest the harvard of the midwest and i remember joking at the uh the brunch before the wedding nuptials or nuptials whatever you call it i said uh <laughs> back in the day if a black man was the best man at a white man's wedding in, in missouri he was known as dred scott so it's all these white people with money kind of quiet when i said that <laughs> i told one of the elder white women i say don't shake your family tree too hard something may fall out of that that you don't like something may fall out the family tree that you may not like <laughs> certain type of fruit <laughs> but to me my he was a <laughs> Dustin to me, like I was like Magic Johnson to his Larry Bird. We were we were both visual artists. He he's a very gifted visual artist. But he had a lot of respect for my artistry. This guy Dustin, right? And we went to Governor School for the Arts in the summer of 1997. This is like the summer before my senior year in high school. That's why I met Dustin. We were both from Memphis. I believe he went to White Station. I went to uh Overton High School and was weird not weird but i remember i was at my in the studio at school in college i was up in st louis at wash U, and i was in the studio of the art school building one of the studios that's painting late at night and all of a sudden dustin came out of nowhere like a leprechaun i used to see like strange things in the art school building late at night and like i'm not expecting this dude my freshman year in college right i ain't expect this dude to pop out of nowhere in the art school at night and he's just visiting because he's trying to figure out what school he wanted to go to and he, he decided on going to wash you you know so he followed me to wash you so to speak and um unfortunately we lost touch over the years but i connected him with his wife who also went to school with us and they decided maybe the best man it did not work out for them she's now remarried with a daughter a beautiful daughter out in the west the west coast out in san francisco and i think brother dustin still might be in a state of misery but uh um, yeah he made me the best man at his wedding and so i was like the only black person in the wedding party in the official wedding party so i wasn't serving nobody hors d'oeuvres and nothing like that or hors d'oeuvres and all that stuff but i was just cracking little racial jokes and it was funny to me at the time i said like you know only way a black man will be a best man in a white man's wedding he gotta be like dred scott which is to be a slave <laughs> yeah yeah watch you was interesting i still got trauma from dealing with watch you man i ain't gonna lie to you i still got some trauma but what saved me while i was going to watch you was having a connection to the black community in st louis i was blessed to have black people from the community look out for me and support me even have black professors i didn't even take classes from they supported me i was able to come to their office hours just the vet or vent i mean vent and i uh, just talk about my you know just issues with dealing with this predominantly white institution because i was not prepared to deal with some of the stuff i had to go through at wash U. and i'm still kind of like working my, my my mind around it even though it's been 20 something years ago it's kind of like you know you think about bernard king you know the great bernard king a great basketball player he went to the university of tennessee knoxville now i'm not saying i had the type of experience that bernard king had at the university of tennessee because Bernard King was one of the top basketball players in the country, and yet they'll treat him like he was an average, you know what? You know what I'm saying? He'll get harassed by the police, even though he's on the cover of Sports Illustrated. Y'all treat this man like he's a nobody, like he's a thug, like he's a nobody. And I remember seeing a documentary, I believe, on sports on ESPN, excuse me. And this man was talking about his his experiences being arrested up in Knoxville. Now, I was born in Knoxville at the University of Tennessee Hospital. And it's something about East Tennessee is weird to me. It's kind of evil feeling. It's a sinister feel out in East Tennessee. 
Like I'm in West Tennessee and Memphis. Memphis you got black people, you got the blues, you got the soul. But the farther east you get out there, I call it Trump country. And you know, I, I, I like Trump, but you know, this is when the Confederate flag start getting bigger and bigger. The farther east you go out in Tennessee, and Knoxville's out in eastern Tennessee. But he talked about being harassed by the police when he was in college. This stuff happened like 30 something years ago, and he was on the documentary crying. I mean, it's like the trauma. You understand? So, like, you know, Wash U, I dealt with a lot of crap at Wash U. They used to call me Mr. Unteachable at the art school. I just had professors say, oh, there go Mr. Unteachable. I said, Mr. Unteachable? I never had classes from these professors. They said, well, you got this reputation because you always ask them questions that we don't want to answer. Like, you always question authority and stuff, and you already got your own way of doing art, you know? I said, what does, like, I'm not Mr. Unteachable. I'm just, I'm myself. I'm just being myself, but I'm going to say that for my memoirs or autobiography, Mr. Unteachable, but they used to call me that. But, um, yeah, but anyway, but Patrick was living in um, rural m misery with a white woman as his wife and uh, mixed kids. And he's doing this black media stuff. You know, he's not hiding his face. You can see who he is. He's very open, honest cat. A beautiful brother, I mean, in terms of his spirit of sharing. <laughs> yeah, they, they had an interesting response to it. It was interesting. But it was all love, man. Like, you know, it was a special day for my friends. And I wish it would have worked out. But things have a way of working out in the end. Yeah, they were fascinating. They, they said, this is, well, I see why you want those Negroes. They went to watch you. One of those special Negroes. But uh, I think I'm still on. Uh, okay. Y'all can still hear my voice, I think. But, you know, Patrick living in rural misery, right? That's a clan state. You got the Ozarks, right? Sundown town. That's misery. So Patrick was, you know, Cat was a... Uh, I would say in a lot of ways fearless, but you got to think about it. Like, that divorce hurt him so bad, dealing with that white lady. So I'm not saying, like, you know, people will run around. Y'all talk about black women on this platform. And look, I already deal with my with, with the sisters as best I can. <laughs> I rather deal with the sisters as best I can. You know, but... It's not about color of skin. It's about color of a character. It's about your character. It's about your personality at the end of the day because Baba Dick Gregory will always say white is an attitude. White is an attitude. If you don't have enough money in the bank, you can't be white. See, a lot of people that are classified as white today weren't white over 100 years ago. It's like black people used to be classified as Native Americans, then they made us something else. You understand what I'm saying? So it's a game that these people play, that the powers that, that be play. Now, my thing is, if I don't get with any woman at this age, I'm 40 years old now, I can't, I got to have peace of mind at home. I got to have some, somebody got my back. I got to have peace of mind at home. I got to have somebody who, who understands me, who overstands who I am, where I'm coming from, how she could be of assistance to me, uh, and, and vice versa. I can't have confusion and just frustration at home. You understand? And, like, you know, you got to be careful who you decide to lay down with to help children. Because look what Dr. Dre is going through right now with the brain aneurysm. To me, nobody dies a natural death in show business. Nobody died a natural death in show business. So, Dre, all that stress. I mean, maybe he should just give a give a like a hundred million, two hundred million, and just be done with it. I don't know. But what I'm saying is, is that sometimes you got to pick your poison, and there ain't no such thing as a pretty divorce. So it, evidently, it took his toll on brother Mark. Uh, I mean, not brother Mark, but brother Patrick. He just had to check out. You know, also he he took his life on December twenty second. That's also the birthday of John Michelle Basquiat. If y'all hip to art, the black art and all that, John Michelle, 
one of the, the highest selling artists of all time regardless of color haitian puerto rican black american cat right john michelle basket his birthday was december 22nd he would have been 60 years young in 2020 but he checked out of here drug overdose at the age of 27 back in august 12 1988 So, I guess Brother Patrick knew how to make an entrance and an exit. Yeah, but um, yeah, I'm not really looking either. Right now, I'm available. <laughs> I'm very much available, but uh not really looking like that i i'm look i think what people gotta understand you gotta be comfortable with yourself with me and myself and i really i'm not lonely i'm alone by myself a lot but i'm not lonely like i could deal with being with myself dealing with my thoughts even dealing with my trauma uh dealing with my pain because i you know I, i'm a creative person you look around me my art i create i i play instruments i sing i create i write i'm very expressive it's very therapeutic to be expressive you understand i don't need the crowd's approval now i do things like this to share my ideas and thoughts because i feel like i'm put here to serve to be of service to be of use to people but i don't even have to do this all the time i could just go away and be fine with it but this is part of my God work. I know it. It's like the art thing. I love art. Like this picture right here. Y'all say y'all want me to talk more about my art, right? But this picture is called My Uncle Arthur the Martyr. My Uncle Arthur the Martyr. This is a picture I did based on my Uncle Arthur, Arthur Taylor Jr. Uh, he died back in 2003 at the age of 40 from complications of AIDS and HIV. From HIV and AIDS, that's me holding up my uncle because I used to take him to his doctor's appointment in the last months of his life. Uh, I used to take him to the doctor's appointment downtown, you know, get his stuff he had to get. But at the end, he just whatever. He just gave him the ghost. And um, I want to tell you about my uncle Arthur, right? My uncle Arthur was a very precocious ch uh, child. He was the youngest child of my maternal grandparents he was the last he was the sixth child of my maternal grandparents i believe you I is he the youngest i want to say he was the youngest i think him my aunt dorothy but i'm gonna tell you what happened to him my uncle arthur i know he was the youngest of the three boys right my two other uncles are still alive. My mama and her other two sisters are still alive. He's the only one that's deceased. My uncle Arthur, he died at 40. I'm gonna tell you about my uncle Arthur, what happened to him. My uncle Arthur was a victim of a child predator. Child sex predator. Uh we had two, they had two known child sex predators in the neighborhood back then. One was a prominent a uh, historical black college professor and serve it on the board of a, of a prominent church in the community in the neighborhood I ain't gonna call it a community i'm called neighborhood and his thing was he would lure kids to his home to cut his grass with candy and money and then he would chase the kids around his home and rape them luckily my other uncles got away from this guy he tried to do the same thing to my other uncles they was able to get away from him Right, this was a prominent college professor at the local HBCU in Memphis and also served on the board of a prestigious church in the in the neighborhood. So you had another child sex predator uh, who lived on the same block as my grandparents and their and my mama and their family. And his sister would lure lure boys to their home so that her brother can rape them. So he was two known predators in that neighborhood. This is a black neighborhood. Black people, black, nobody did anything about it. They just allowed these guys to operate with impunity. So 
my uncle was making good grades in elementary school. Then all of a sudden, he started not making good grades, started being very disruptive in class and stuff like that. So the teacher found out that he was being molested by this guy that lived on the same block as my grandparents, my mom and all them. So they had a parent, a parent principal te teacher conference with my grandmother. So the principal was there and the teacher was there. They'll talk to my grandma and told her what they found out about my situation with my, my uncle. My grandmother wanted to go to police about it. And then the principal and the teacher said, don't do that. Just keep them away from the guy. So my uncle still was able to get raped some more times from my understanding. Now, this is like, you know, people didn't really tell me everything. It's what I found out later. He's still not only raping my uncle, he's raping other black boys in the neighborhood. Nobody did anything about it. So my uncle grew up. Never got any type of therapy for his trauma, for that severe type of trauma that he experienced while he was growing up. Um, just confused, I think, about because I think in my mind he wanted to have a family, a traditional family with wife and kids, but the other stuff, like he feel like I guess he, he blamed himself for being raped and taken advantage of at a young age. So he went back and forth, I believe, struggling with that sexual thing. And so my uncle was interested by him. I'd never seen a brother upset about anything. He had an amazing sense of humor. He could tell stories and joke. He used to sing the one in the million. He loved that song. He used to sing that at reunions and stuff like that. Chance of a lifetime. You know that song. And whoa, one in a million. You know. He loved that song, but um, he had a great sense of humor, and he was the type of dude that would do the Christian thing. He would visit the sick and the shut-in and all that stuff, you know. Uh, he was a, a amazing human being, and like at the, he had a speech impediment, though. He used to stutter sometimes. It would be interesting next to him. I used to hate sitting next to him while I was eating because he'd be spitting there with He'd be talking and shit. He'd be talking <laughs> Spit in and have everybody laughing though. And what I love about my uncle was that he was the dude that made sure that everybody met for Sunday dinner. He made sure either my mom, my aunt, or somebody would cook Sunday dinner and everybody would come over somebody's house. We all eat and exchange things about what was going on with us uh the past week and uh just cheer each other up and be encouraging. He was a connector like that, you know, he had a big heart, you know, and I never seen him mad. Like, I never seen, I'm sure he was mad, but he never was like a bitter person. But I remember before he died, my mom and I, we picked him up from a uh, telephone. We call it, you know, he's a, you know, public telephone booth on Lamar. I think he got into it with his lover or something like that. And he was just crying uncontrollably, just crying. And it was really sad, you know, because. I feel like he was just crying about all this, the crap he had gone through in his life. And that, like, he's 40 years old and he still don't have a peace of mind or that love that he always wanted for himself, either from himself or from somebody else. So, I mean, it was just sad to see him cry like that, but he used to tell me, um, like, I always take him to his appointments downtown. Like, we'll be at a stoplight, and he'll say, you see that guy over there? I said, yeah, the, the, the hard dude, the thug, look at this. He, said, he gay. He said, he gay. Yeah, he's a, you know, you can't go by people's looks. So you, you be pointing people out, you know, they'd be rough-looking cats, like rough-neck-looking dudes and stuff, like them bad boys that, that girls like, you know. He's all there. He gay, he gay, he gay, he gay, he gay. But what he couldn't understand growing up, how people make fun of him, call him gay and all this stuff and a faggot and all that, they say, look, yeah, but uh, you know, I sucked his thingy and he's not gay. You know, he sucked me and he's not gay. You know, I'm just saying the hypocrisy of it all, the contradictions, right? So you were dealing with all that. And uh he was drinking when he should have been drinking with the medication at the end. And uh I remember, man, I brought him. 
the, the day he went to the hospital, that night he went to the hospital, I brought, it's back to July 2003. I brought him, my grandfather, he was living with my grandfather. I brought him, my grandfather, to McDonald's. And uh, I believe he was on the couch in the, in the, in the living room. Like he, could, he, like, he looked very lethargic. Like, you know, he, he was a small dude, but it's like he was heavy. Like he had dead weight on him, right? And so later on that day, I brought them Kentucky Fried Chicken. He was still in the same place. Like, you know, what's going on? Like, why he's not moving? Then the next day, I know they had to rush him to the hospital. And by the end of the weekend, he was dead. And uh, at 40. So I did this picture in honor of him for HIV Awareness Month. I believe they had a contest. An art contest somewhere locally i did it and i don't know if you can see the detail of his lips like before he died he developed like crushed you know he had you call it when you, you when your wound is healing it develop a scale a scab he had scab like stuff on his mouth scab like lesions on his mouth that covered his whole lips both top and bottom but what's interesting is that he was very charismatic and he was a talker like, you know, he had a speech impediment and all this stuff. But people was just so fascinated by him. He was a unique character. There was nobody like my Uncle Arthur. He, like I said, he could tell a story like nobody's business. And could have you laughing and everything, peeing on yourself, laughing so hard. Like Bobby Dick Gregory said, sometimes the greatest laugh you ever had came from your family or friends. It didn't come from a comedian. It came from somebody you knew real well. And my Uncle Arthur was a naturally gifted, funny person. So, like, we'll be at hot dog stands and hamburger stands. He had all this stuff on his damn mouth. And folks will just be in his face. Like, we know we got to practice social distance now. But folks will just be in his face looking at him like he had them under hypnosis. He's spitting everywhere and shit. I mean, you don't know, this dude had HIV and stuff, AIDS, whatever. <laughs> and people didn't care. Like, they were so, like, hypnotized by this dude. Dude had charisma. But... When he died, what was interesting, when they was making him up at the funeral home, they was able to peel that off of his mouth, and his lips looked like they were normal, like normal lips. Like, he had them scab lesions on his mouth. They peeled it off, and his lips were okay. And also, I remember, like, he used to ride the bus all the time. He didn't have a car at the end. He used to ride the bus. I think his license was uh, suspended or something like that. But he rode the bus a lot, and there used to be a dog that would wait for him at the bus stop always walking from the bus stop back to his home where he lived with my grandfather you would walk would wait for him to come out and walk him i mean this is weird then when he died that dog stopped coming around it stopped coming around so yeah so i did this picture under my uncle arthur my uncle arthur the Martyr. so he died young forever young would never grow old. It's like Patrick didn't even make it to 50. He died young, would never grow old. But yeah, y'all be careful out there who y'all decide to make a life with. And understand and overstand your value as a human being. Because Patrick, mm, Patrick was a, a, a decent brother. Like, I never met him. Like, he offered, like, when I first talked to him, he said, well, well Ron, you're in St. Louis area, man. Stay with me, man. You can stay with me. Like, he offered his home to me. And I appreciate that. He was a good brother. I think he was looking to be a part of something that was bigger than himself. And he wanted to help purpose. And I believe this from hearing you all, that he had purpose, that he served a purpose. That his life was not in vain. It's just unfortunate that he was in such pain that he couldn't receive all the love that people had for him, including his family, I believe. But I just want to honor this brother because we tend to forget about the ones who really put it all on the line in their own way. And Patrick put it all on the line in his own way. I just wish I could have helped him more. I it just I'm realizing that I can't save nobody, man. I can only save myself. But I can share the best of myself with the people and hopefully it can inspire them to do something for themselves while they're helping other people. I'm going to tell you all, self-care is the best health care. Don't forget about yourself in this struggle. I'm learning how to take care of myself now at 40. 
I I didn't I, I, I'm just realizing how I was destroying my health. I think I was helping people when I was hurting myself. So I, I'm telling people right now: be forgiving, be kind, be patient towards yourself before anybody else. If you can't be kind, forgiving, patient, and loving towards yourself, you can't be there for nobody else. It's not real. Because really, you can heal yourself by being just kind, patient, and loving towards yourself. Give yourself a chance before you give somebody else a chance. Because, you know, I'm learning that now, man. Like, you know, dealing with my struggles, <laughs> my demons, man. I'm not even interested in destroying my demons. I just want to make peace with these bastards so I can do my work. <laughs> but Patrick, man, I, I just look at them, them eyes, man. Man, my God. Yeah, give yourself grace. Yeah, well, man, I, I'm just tired of see this vaccination. I ain't mean, gonna talk about that, but I'm just saying, if you allow your kids to be lab rats and guinea pigs. And, and collateral damage and cannon fodder for this evil, wicked system. You don't deserve to have any progeny. You don't deserve to have a bloodline or a legacy. Because you're not protecting the children. You're not saving the children. And we got to be serious about this. Because we're not winning. Black people do not win when we play identity politics. All this, oh, he's the first black or she's the first black. And they don't do us no good. Because kinfolk, all kinfolk ain't skinfolk. And sometimes your kinfolk would do you in. It's always an inside job. All this, like, first this and first that. No, we want to be liberated. Let us be all be first, be one in liberation, in self-determination. You know, I don't, <laughs> I'll be honest with you, to be real, a YouTube video ain't going to change your life. Us having conversation on YouTube ain't going to change your life. A lot of y'all look at information as entertainment. Like, y'all don't care about doing anything with the information. It's this intellectual masturbation. I'm just, oh, oh, my brain, oh, oh, what a high, man. What a high. That's all. There's nothing to it, right? But 2020 was hindsight, right? Now 2021 should be clarity and plan of action. You should be, this should be the season, I mean, the season of action orientation, right? So... Mm -hmm. I appreciate that. We love you madly. Thank you, sister. Ro Royster, appreciate you. Yeah, my uncle was a good guy. I mean, just complex. Being human is a complex experience, right? I don't believe having contradictions mean you're a hypocrite. I just, it just mean that you're complex. The human nature is complex. To be a hypocrite is to, to, to me, to be a hypocrite is to, to uh, deny the contradictions. Is to deny the contradictions, right? You know, you look at Patrick. He wanted to save and help people, but he couldn't save and help himself. That's not being a hypocrite. That's just contradictions. Yeah, people don't give themselves a chance, man. Because you, if you think about it, the way they got a program, you think about a commercial. A commercial is all about making you feel inadequate. Everything you really need resides inside of you. Your energy. Like people say, I got energy. I'm talking about your energy, your inner God. This shell, this body is a temple for that light. For that God within. You manifest your reality. Whatever you feel about yourself on the inside, whatever you think on the inside, you can make that the re a reality on the outside. That's the secret. That's the secret. I mean, like, commercials and stuff, this consumerism society is all about making you feel inadequate where you got to have the need or desire to consume. You feel like I must fill myself up with all these things, but yet you still feel empty. You could like, you know, people that eat a lot. 
or smoke a lot or screw a lot. You're doing all this stuff in the extreme levels, but you can never be satisfied. I can't get no satisfaction. You see what I'm saying? Can't get no satisfaction. You are made to feel inadequate by design. That's how they exploit you. Like people use drugs to make themselves feel a high. Like somehow people who use a drug for the first time, they constantly will be chasing that high for the rest of their lives. Like, you know, the first time they use this type of drug, it will never be that type of high again. So you constantly chasing that high that you'll never get. So you got to use more and more drugs, more and more extreme stuff, and then you end up destroying yourself. You look at Billie Holiday. And I love Billie Holiday, but she was in pain. She was self-medicating through self-destructive behavior. I talk about John Michelle Basquiat. He was self medicating through self destructive behavior. Charlie Parker, a, a lot of us. But the key to living is to learn the art of moderation. If you want to live a longer time, <laughs> you want to be moderate, you know, in a lot of ways, in a lot of things, in your practices. So I'm learning it myself. I'm trying to figure out how long I want to live <laughs> right now. You know what I'm saying? But I want to leave my own terms. I don't want to leave because I got the sugars and all that shit. I don't want to leave because of that. They chopped me up like a damn steak. I don't want to leave because of that. I want to leave on my own terms. Do what I want to do. As long as I want to do it. Yeah, a lot of us are wounded healers. I mean, you can't help but be wounded in a system that don't respect your humanity or you as a full person. So. I think that's black people in general. We the chosen people for that reason. Because our special connection to nature and the universe. And our empathy and compassion. That we don't give ourselves, which is sad. A lot of us don't even give ourselves the same type of consideration, compassion, or empathy that we do for other beings and things. That's insane. Yeah, it is. It's complex. But it's all about, you know... To me, I'm very misunderstood, you know, like a lot of people are. I don't think this, I'm special because of that, but, you know, even when I see people coming on my post and stuff, people don't get it where I'm coming from a lot of times. Some of y'all do get it, but at the same time, what Baba Dick Gregory will always say, my truth does not be, need to be validated by your ignorance. I don't need validation by anybody. By me just existing, that's validation enough. I don't need to prove anything. Like I said, I could just step away from this. There's enough people talking on YouTube and in social media, you know, to fill y'all day with entertainment and just, you know, thought porn, intellectual masturbation and thought porn. You got enough of that on your timeline. You don't need Brother Ron adding to that. But my thing is, I'm going to do what I can when I can, you know, and I just want to uh, encourage folks that's going through stuff like Brother Patrick. You don't have to suffer in silence. You don't have to suffer in silence. There's nothing wrong with letting people know that you are in pain, that you need love, that you need care, that you need to be noticed, that you, you that you have a need to be wanted or desired. It's nothing wrong with that. It's being that's very much having a human experience. But uh, I don't know. You know, I had a friend. Her brother committed suicide. A black man. A lot of us checking out of here. A lot of us are checking out of here, right? A lot of black men. I mean, I look at my high school class. It's like the women, there's some beautiful black women in my high school class, right? A lot of them, even it was some that were ugly ducklings that look like swans now. They look, they look gorgeous. It got better with time. But a lot of the brothers in the class are checking out of here. We leaving this planet. We're not getting the love that we need to stay. I mean, we might have a wife, we might have kids, but we're not. Get enough, whatever we need, to stay here for a long time. And we don't see the value. I mean, black men are not valued, man. I see that every day. People are like, oh, Brian, just man up. You people talking about man up. Why don't y'all get a clue? Ain't just about no manning up. It's about the fact that, hey, our women are programmed to think they don't need us. They don't need black men. I can raise my kids by myself. I could do everything by myself. Ain't no other women on the planet saying that. But black women, black American women, 
And you see what it's getting us as a people, man. You talking about protect black women? How are we gonna protect black women if we ain't raised black men? Protect black women? Come on, man. You want to be God? Be God. But when you being God, you can't have no man. Because you God. So, I mean, my uncle was not protected by the community. Not just my, 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 my look, I, I realized why my people did not want me and my cousins to stay over people's house overnight. I didn't know that until I was much older because what happened to my uncle. But they wouldn't tell us that because it's trauma. It's taboo. Incest, everything. Taboo, taboo, taboo in our community, in our neighborhood. So we can't even protect our children. Talking about protect black women. We can't even protect our, our children in the womb. We can't protect them in the classroom. Juvenile detention. Church. Can't protect them anywhere. Bus stop. Nowhere. Church. You know what I mean? We got to figure something out. And like I said, this brother, he went to the white woman. I'm not judging the brother. Uh, I don't know his wife, but he was going through a nasty divorce and that contributed to his state of mind. I'm not blaming her. I'm going to say he made choices to make a life with a certain person. And there are consequences to all our choices. But uh, Brother Patrick, like I said, I tried to reach out to him. He reached out to me. I answer back. I never, I never hear anything from him after that. And I remember sometimes when you know, Dr. Rennie Short put us on a conference call together or something like that. It kind of, I guess, seemed awkward for him, but it wasn't awkward for me. It's all love. I ain't had no problem with uh, Brother Patrick because I didn't know him like that. And everybody got their reason. Like I explained to Dr. Short, anybody said, "Look, I got my, I got shit. I'm going through, so I ain't gonna always answer the phone or return a text and all that. You know, that just." Don't mean I don't like you. You know, somebody would like Dr. Shaw say, treat me white. I said, brother, I'm treating you white. I don't like to deal with white folks on a regular basis <laughs> directly. It's like they don't like to deal with us directly if they can. But it's their system where they don't need to deal with us at all to get what they want from us. But like, you know, I have my trauma. Like I said, well, watch you. I have trauma. That's the need resolved from dealing with my watch you experience. <laughs> I remember reading somewhere Dr. Carter G. Wilson, the father of Black History Week or Negro History Week, which became Black History Month. It took him like 20 years to deal with the stuff he went through in Harvard, Harvard University. It took him about 20 years to deal with that madness. Like he was the second black person to get a PhD from Harvard after Du Bois. And Dr. W.E.B. Du Bois talk about the trauma he dealt with going to Harvard, couldn't stay on campus and stuff like that. So I, I definitely got my watch you stories right they'll probably claim me one day oh ron Hurd went to washington university he's like so and so so and so who gives a damn you know but like i said what saved me at washington with my relationship with black people on and off the campus that will save me as a person it was the village so we need to find a way to help a village even under these circumstances that we found ourselves in found ourselves in as black men women and child um. Oh, yeah, I agree with that. Cause people want to talk about Malcolm. Malcolm didn't know everything. Malcolm didn't didn't they didn't have social media and world star hip hop and all this other stuff when Malcolm was alive. Black straight men are feared. There's a lot of dudes that act effeminate because they're afraid to be bold alpha black males. Or black men, because you see what happens in society. We are a bold alpha black man. They make examples. Look at you know Fred Hampton, Bunchy Carter. They get you while you're young, right? Look at Malcolm and Martin. They was even allowed to be forty. Mega Evers, thirty-seven years young. You know they won't. They, they, even they call us men when we boys. Look at Emmett Till, Tamir Rice. Black men are not, uh, you know, we're not allowed to be human. Okay, I would say with black people in general, we're either subhuman or superhuman, according to white people's mind and mythology. According to white people's mind and mythology, we either subhuman or superhuman. Anything but just a regular human being. Thank you, Sheila Royster, for your donation via the cash out. We love you madly. 
appreciate that. But um, it's interesting. I think I just talked enough. So let me. Yeah, nobody can handle this stuff alone, man. Stress is the silent killer. You understand? And there's a reason why a lot of us got high blood pressure. We think it's inherited. If you're always in a constant fight or flight mode, you can't help but have high blood pressure and all type of heart disease and diabetes because your body's never at rest as black people. We are always some type of traumatic state in this system that does not recognize our humanity. So you got all just, just living. So you don't, you don't even die a natural death because what they're doing to us on a daily basis is not natural, does not exist in nature. It's their system that's killing us. But, like, you got to find a way to take care of yourself. Like, Bob Dick Gregory said, three things are killing people. Lack of sleep, lack of exercise, and lack of water. A lot of us don't like drinking water. But you you find water in different sources of food and, uh, and stuff. You know, not to be like a straight glass of water. You can find water in fruits and watermelon, for example. Come on. So, we got to start being creative for our survival because this is a purge season. Like, well, black folks don't realize when we vote a certain way, we're not only voting for our replacements, we're voting for our genocide. We're voting for our extinction. We're voting for our, this, you know, elimination. So this is purge season. This is the Hunger Games. This is Terminator. This is when Mars attack. They keep on talking about these aliens and UFOs. They are already here, folks. They've been here. So all this stuff is about to be exposed on the eve of January the 6th. See, what people don't understand about this Trump thing, Trump is draining a swamp. It's a divine thing. It's not it's bigger than Trump, but Trump is being utilized by a higher force to reveal all the contradictions so that you can't say, I didn't know no better. Now, you're going to know, and then a lot of us going to make choices that's going to undermine our success for survival as individuals as well as collectives. So I'm not cheering for anybody just because they're the first black this on that. You got to show me what your color of character is. I'm more concerned about your color of character, not your color of skin. So with that said, I'm going to step back a little bit. I'm going to play the first show I did on the True Power is Mind platform with brother Patrick Weaver and his his row die sidekick wingman Scotty Pittman, uh, brother Dimebag. Shout out to brother Dimebag. I hope he's doing, he's taking care of himself. But I'm gonna play that in its entirety, and y'all should check out the two true power is mine, uh, YouTube channel. Child, download that good stuff before they delete it. I don't know if you talking about people deleting stuff off his YouTube channel. So get some of that information out there while you can. Uh, archive it. Do what you gotta do because information is power, as Baba Dick Greg would say. Good information is good power. Bad information is bad power. And I say knowledge is the currency of the universe. So thank y'all for listening. We love y'all madly. And uh, the show must go on. We must bury the man and continue to plan. But uh, Brother Patrick is now a righteous ancestor. He's more powerful as an ancestor. He can move around with more energy than when he was in his shell. Well, you know, his wife is, I think, got access to the channel. I don't think she has a channel, but with my understanding that she deleted some of the videos that were on the channel. And Sister Tasha, you send me the Facebook link, it don't work. I ain't get a chance to email you that. Uh, Sister Tasha, like your Facebook link to some of your content, I couldn't, get, it was a broken link. So you could just resend that to your, e your email. I appreciate that. Thank you for being a listener and being a real mythite. Like, brother, Egg Pay, he didn't, he don't call us mythians, he called us mythites. We mythites. Like, you know, we got the Egyptian connection going on. Yeah, it's stress. Unless you, you mean, you know, I'll I tell you this then. Let's look at it. We got, you got, um, you got ancestral memory. You got generation, you know, you got generational trauma. You got your own personal trauma. This thing, I believe, a generation curses, like unresolved trauma from previous generations. I guess it could be inherited, but then you got choice. 
you have self-determination. You could do things in your power to eliminate the high blood pressure, to deal with the diabetes, right? You can reverse a lot of that stuff. So, like, you know, Dick Gregory used to smoke packs of cigarettes a day, drink a fifth of scotch, was over 300 pounds. You wouldn't believe that looking at him in his later life that he was over 300. I remember talking to Reverend C.T. Vivian, how he talking about the first time he met Baba Dick Gregory, he was like 300 pounds. You know, and Bobby Dick Gregory was a track star in high school and college. <coughs> he used to run track. I mean, he used to stay in shape when he got out of school by jogging and running. But, he, you know, due to entertainment lifestyle, that, that hectic lifestyle, you know, on late nights and late foods, late dinners and all that stuff. And his lifestyle led to poor diet. It, it caught up with him. But, yeah, even Dick Gregory. Like, I know I go up and down and stuff. I'm working on myself as well. So I know it's not a benefit uh, as I get older to have all this, you know, weight, you know, on me. Even though I can move <laughs> better than some people with half my size. Like, like I said, I've been, I could jog six and a half miles, six miles now. And I be in the gyms where it make you wear the mask, man. So I jog a whole hour over six miles without stopping with the mask on. And I sweat a lot. The damn mask make you feel like you're claustrophobic. I'm jogging with that on. Cause they said we inherited some superpowers, right? On well, December twenty first, the grand conjunction, whatever that was, you're supposed to inherit some superpowers. I guess I got stamina, cause I used to, you know, I always had that really because I love dancing, and so people tell me, well, Ron be on the floor for hours just dancing, nonstop. So that's always been me, and uh, we all got amazing abilities, especially black people. We got certain gifts and talents. But we never, a lot of us will never acknowledge or realize those gifts and talents because we let this system that does not recognize our full humanity to define our potential and limitations and expectations. You got to feed this mind here to free your behind. Your mind will free your behind. Your imagination in particular can actualize and realize some things that people with limited vision and lack of imagination try to tell you. That you should do or who you should be. You need to reimagine yourself. We all need to re reimagine ourselves as individuals as well as collective. Now he was big in the 60s. He was actually big. Like I said, Reverend C.T. Vivian, those guys, they know. Reverend C.T. Vivian, he, he told me himself, I met Dick Gregory, man, with 300 pounds. <laughs> Dick was big, man. He, he lost weight. When he started protesting the Vietnam War, he started going on hunger strikes. A lot of things would help with Dick health. He was fast, but also he was starving himself to death. He was doing like revolutionary suicide. Dick, and shout out Dr. Randy Short. Dick was doing revolutionary suicide because he was not just fasting, he would like starve himself. And then I remember talking to him like when he did the cross country runs and stuff. His doctor told him that there'll be long-term health effects by doing those runs. And he showed me the physical effects of him doing all this stuff to his body, like running across country like Forrest Gump. Dick Gregory was the real Forrest Gump, but he was he was brilliant. He was no all shucks Forrest Gump. He actually had a brain. But, you know, the stuff that he got involved with over his life is like he lived like nine or 12 lives in one life. And uh, it should be some movies and docu-series about dick gregory amazing life yeah you know i tell y'all things about dick gregory i wouldn't even believe that he did them but people would test they will attest that he did that they will hey, we were witness to what he did so he don't get enough credit man so he's a righteous ancestor but he reminds us i appreciate that i received that sister betty thank you so much but he reminds us that um you have value. Like I said, he said the three three things killing people, lack of sleep, lack of exercise, and lack of water. And he talked about vitamin D. I mean, he was on my show years ago talking about the benefits of uh, vitamin D and L-arginine. Now, what they pushing, vitamin D, right? He talked about L-arginine, help you, uh, you know, eliminate heart disease, heart attack, and stuff like that. Dick was already talking about this. He was way ahead of the curve. And what he did was he experimented on himself a lot of times. But um, I'm going to wrap this up. I talked more than I thought I'm going to be under an hour talking. But I want to play 
my first interview that Patrick did of me on the other morning show. It's been a minute since I listened to it myself. But uh, I want to thank Brother Patrick, man, because uh, he just don't know how much he was loved by the people. I'm seeing the, all this love y'all giving him, and uh, just don't know sometimes. You just don't know, man. But it's on us to, uh, like Dr. John Henry Clark said, you got to bury the man and continue to plan. It doesn't stop with Patrick. This is only the beginning for Patrick because he's going to do a lot of help for us on the other side of this equation. So thank y'all for listening to me, for tolerating me. Uh, they're already working, actually, on a documentary about Baba. I went, I was at his uh, funeral, at his wake. It was a brother from California. They're actually doing a documentary on Baba Dick Gregory. He raised a lot of money behind it. And he interviewed me and some other Baba's chosen uh, for that. And I, I'll, I'll help some projects dealing with Baba Dick Gregory. because They're talking about having a Dick Gregory Society. I talked to some of his family. Members. You know how strange America is, though? Like his brother told me, he said, look, uh, when that show about Dick Gregory Life came out with uh, the guy from Scandal, Joe Morton, when he was playing Dick Gregory, he said, look, man, you got to pay $100 to see somebody imitate Dick Gregory. But when Dick Gregory Live, you could have paid like $20 to see the real Dick Gregory. But for the imitation, you pay like 100 plus. When you got the real Dick Gregory, who had his phone number listed in the phone book for decades, well, I'll tell you, all I got to do is look on the white pages. Dick Gregory's phone number is in the white pages. He always been a public figure. He's old school. Never had a bodyguard. Always had his phone number in the phone book. But you, but people will pay over $100 for the fake or the copycat or the actor, not the real deal. But you could got the real Dick Gregory uh, for less than what you spend at Applebee's. Could I actually talk with him, met him, broke bread with him, all that stuff. But it's like, well, they asked BB King one time. They said, Well, BB King, what do you think about the Beatles? The Beatles. He said, All they did was reimport the blues. Because what BB King was saying was that when they used to go over to England, you had people like John Lennon and Paul McCartney and Eric Clapton and Keith Townsend. They were poor, poor white trash coming to Piccadilly Square to ask the masters of the craft, like the BB Kings. And the Bo Diddleys and the Willie Dixons, how to play the blues. And the white folks went crazy over the Beatles when you had Muddy Waters and Holland Wolf. Look, Rolling Stones named out a Muddy Waters song. You had all the originals here all this time, but your damn hatred. It's like with Otis Redding. He didn't know how popular he was until he went to England. And nobody knew what he looked like over there because when they used to get the albums, like remember that movie, The Five Heartbeats? They had white people on the cover. So they didn't know what Otis Redding looked like. They knew what he sounded like, but before he died, he was able to get all those flowers from the people over in England. They went crazy over him. What I'm saying is, like, they were always say we got to love ourselves enough to not let these folks define who we are nor dictate our value. We got to reclaim all this stuff on our own terms and be okay with not being accepted by people that don't even love you. Why do you want to be accepted by people that don't even love you? Why not accept yourself and practice some type of self-love so you can have some genuine love for other people? Because how are you going to love other people and not have no genuine love for yourself? That's crazy. Yeah. Well, Dick wasn't there. I mean, he was close. Dick was close to Malcolm and Muhammad Ali. But that was back in Miami. You know, you had Malcolm, you had Sam Cooke, you had Jim Brown, and you had Cassius Clay, who became Muhammad Ali. That's based on an actual event. But Dick was close to Muhammad Ali and Malcolm. You know, and so it's on us to tell our story. You can't see, even though Regina King produced that, white folks still got the final say. She, she had to utilize white folks' studio money. Like, even the Fred Hampton movie. I'm not expecting no revelation because I've been studying Fred Hampton for years. I had a chance to thank his mother on the phone over 10 years ago. Because, you know, people don't know Fred Hampton's mother used to, uh, used to uh, babysit Amy Till. She used to babysit Amy Till, Fred Hampton's mom. And then they started spying on her son when he was about 14 or 15, the government did. And he only lived to be 21 years young. 
So I had, a, I had a chance to thank her and I had a chance to interview his brother, who was his real brother's keeper. They both died within the last four or five years. You know, but I had a chance to talk to his brother and his mom and thank her. And uh, I believe they still shooting at Fred Hampton's tombstone down in Louisiana to this day. You know, and he's been dead since 1969. Why, why do they fear dead black men so much? I don't know. Well, Dick always in the mix, man. Dick, I mean, that's another look. I'm talking about brother Patrick. I can talk about Dick Gregor all the time. I, I, I could do another show about Dick Gregor. Don't get enough credit for what he done. So there's so much to Dick Gregor. It's very complex. But he actually gave up his family for the movement, man. Like you say, I'll never win father. Yeah, I wasn't a great father. His his wife raised the children, and their anniversary is coming up on February the second. And uh, with Dick, well, his wife was interesting. His wife Lil is interesting because. She actually was prepared for dealing with a man like Dick Gregory because her father, her father was a prominent minister in Ohio. Her father was a prominent black minister in Ohio. He used to go around opening up churches in Ohio. So he would always be gone all the time. And I believe her father passed away when she was in college. So I, I heard Dick talking about his wife and who, who her people were on the Carl Nelson show one time. So what I'm going to do now, I'm going to play that that um that first interview that patrick did of me on his platform and then we'll wrap it up thank y'all hope y'all get something out of it hope y'all got something out of this conversation uh like i said it's, i lost a lot of people right? i didn't realize i lost man I, it's a lot of things i'm trying to get through and just being myself and this the year is flying by pretty fast i'm trying to put some things together like i said i the jimmy Lonsford thing i want to thank everybody who supported the jimmy Lonsford festival thing i did 14 events over 14 days you know a lot of things were canceled last year a lot of festivals in memphis memphis in may uh bill street blues festival african in april and i did that i don't help nobody really help my mom is my biggest supporter but really that's me doing that work and the research and you know trying to book people for shows that takes a lot on a person i'm doing a lot of stuff i've been doing this for 20 years consciously doing this work so excuse me if i didn't I always can't answer the phone or be there for y'all you know I'm working on returning emails. People send me, e I can't, I don't, I'm just a person that like to talk. I don't, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not, a, I'm not that person, but people send me stuff all the time. I think I can help them. And uh, the people who sent me some stuff recently, I'll get back to y'all very soon. I promise. It'll just be a lot of my mind, but um, I'm about to play this debut I did on that show. I think the audio is okay. Y'all can understand it. I think so, for the most part. You know, Patrick is a great man, and, you know, I'm just going to honor him, and we love him madly, and thank y'all for tuning in. And uh, thank you, Nikki Bay, for watching my channel. You said love watching the channel. <sighs> mm, okay, I, uh, so I'm going to play this debut I did on the other morning show, Brother Patrick's channel. And thank y'all for tuning in and not tuning out. So, and we'll come back to close it out. It's recording. You say for now? Yeah, <clears throat> fuck it. <clears throat> you said fuck it. <clears throat> you look behind the scenes. We on Facebook? I'm not on shit. I'm doing that off, off all that stupid shit so I have good, clean video. And then I'm going to take that good, clean video and upload it to uh, YouTube. There you go. Okay, Paul, let's do that. When I upload it, it's going to be uploaded private. Well, you're going to upload it private, and nobody's going to be able to see it. So I'm going to make sure I edit it right, and then before I release it, there ain't going to be no bullshit. Hey, Matt. Yes, sir. Are you sure? Is my uh, phone really important? I hate the way it has to be set up like that. Yeah. Okay, cool. I know I should. We should be in frame and shit. Uh, Call a boy up. All right. 
Oh. No, you gotta be fucking kidding me. Hold on. Dang, you just have my phone call over here. Okay. Hello? Hey, Brother Ron, how you doing? Oh, I'm okay. Hey, brother, brother Patrick? Yeah. Yeah, we just set up everything for the show. Uh, this whole title on the line. I'm doing a final audio check. Uh, your device. Is this the maximum? And now it's all off. What happened? Your phone died or went into sleep mode or whatever. And I know I don't have the right. He's on the line. Well, I know he's holding on the line. I was oh. just doing the final mic check, make sure that's the highest yeah. volume. Mm. Well, once again, brother, thank you. I got a dime bag here. And I got CI, Cobra Immortal here. Just, uh, All right. What's up, brother? How you doing? What's up, brother? I'm, I'm good, man. I'm glad I'm at LeBron right now. How about that? <laughs> oh, hey, we, we checking it out, too, man. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sweet. It's, oh, it's, man, yeah. I guess uh, Kevin Durant got that kill market instinct. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, yes, sir. I was telling my boys that uh, that the Golden State Golden State is the is the new bulls of this era. For how long, though, man? For how long? Uh, well, at least for maybe for the least for the next two years, if possible, if they can get. I don't, I, what if, the reason why I say that, what if uh, LeBron go down to Houston? Yeah, that's what I've been saying. And Chris oh, Paul okay. don't get hurt. Because when Chris Paul, yeah. when they was playing the Rockets, Chris Paul was busting up Curry and they was winning. Then all of a sudden, next thing you know, Paul's out for the rest of the series. I'm like, what the hell's happening? Yeah. Uh, that made the difference right there. They would have probably won it. They, they would have won there. it. Mm-hmm. And, Man, like, you guys don't realize this shit's fixed. Man, here you go with this. I'm sorry for being well, only, only thing, only thing that but, I'm, you know, I don't want to be a killjoy, guys. And the only it's thing like, that I'm saying is, is, it, is if, if LeBron James <laughs> was, to, was to do that, was to go to a team that already had superstars on it, you know what I'm saying? Mm, yeah. It'll make him look like I can't play with anybody but high-caliber all-star players. It will still be fucking. Fixed. You know what I'm saying? Like, day, like that. That's the reason why I can't. I don't like it when a lot of people can try to compare LeBron James to Jordan. It ain't no it, there is no comparison. You know what I'm saying? It's two different eras and two different styles, two so different about, personalities. What about when they well, when the, back in the day when they were uh, all those fools were hyping up Larry Bird and stupid shit like that? Oh, don't get me wrong. Larry Bird was a he was a great player. And then Magic Johnson. They you know they saying? they held it down. And, but you know, can you still uh, quantitate all these cats along with Jordan and LeBron? You know what I'm saying? It's like either we live in the present and we move forward, and you make this money knowing the shit's fixed. All right, and you get with the fixers, mm -hmm. and you get that inside info, and you get paid. Or, you know, you just sit here and have a good time talking about a ball game. Yep. I think that's what we were doing in KU. Pissed all over everything. <laughs> oh, man. But it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just giving you shit, man. But, you know, one thing I will say about Kevin Durant was, like, he was willing to take less money to come to a team. Because, I mean, they try to criticize him, too. Be like, because he wasn't winning nothing I mean, with they, nobody they else. They didn't try. What about Kobe Bryant? Kobe Bryant doesn't even play anymore. I mean, but what about him as far as the lineup and the great players? Well, I mean, Kobe stayed with one team throughout his career, but towards the end of his career, the players wasn't as good. I mean, he, he, he was old. Yeah, he was he was starting to wind it down too. Well, you know, anal sex takes a toll on a guy. Oh god. Smile <laughs> with a thumbnail. <laughs> 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 wow! Yeah, only on, only on the other morning show. Yeah, yeah. Right, we're live on YouTube. Yes, yeah, <laughs> YouTube. Right, what's up? Yeah. Right. Okay. Oh my god! <laughs> All right. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, do you know the day's date at least? Or? I think it's no. I don't know the day's date. What's the day's date? The day's date is oh, Friday, June the eighth. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're gonna get this cracking. Welcome to the other morning show. 
I'm Dimebag Dolly. I'm True Powers Mind. And it is J June the 8th, 2018. The year of our Lord. Lord. First of all, I just want to thank all the supporters of the show, all the subscribers. Dr. O, thank you. Thank uh, you. Everybody Name that's helped us. Everybody that's uh, been with us since day one, just want to say thank you. Been working on some stuff behind the scenes, you know, so just stick with us. Yeah, I, I just want to say, I want to say thank you to the haters that we converted. You know, you started off kind of trolling the pages, but, you know, through diligence and, and rational uh, comments, you guys have actually been, you know, com converted into the other morning show, the other morning crew, you know. And that kind of sucks because I actually liked it, like, comment on Trust the, me, like, as we get bigger. Talk. You know, as soon as we get really big, we gotta get all those. If, if you got guys. one listener out there that that wanted to comment, that comment on somebody else and just say, "Yeah, I tried to uh, to say the same thing," but somebody responded with a smart remark. That was me. Somebody's I just like having fun. But anyway, we got us uh, guests on the line. Want to yes. introduce the guests? We got brother Ron from We All Be TV. Uh, a part of his bio, you know, he's interviewed uh, so many incredible people. He does amazing documentaries. Uh, down below, I will have uh, in the comment section uh, the, all access to the description yes. where you can go find Brother Ryan's material. And yes. And, uh, you know, maybe yourself. he can give us a sneak peek, you know, our <laughs> listeners of his new project that he's been working on. Not the whole thing, you know, let's not do a Ralph Brecht show or, you know, the Hawk guy. Everyone dies in the movie. <laughs> But let's not do that, but give the people a little tidbit. I don't know, man. You know mm. how it is. You give somebody an inch, they're going to take a mile. Mm. <laughs> proceed, <laughs> proceed with caution. That's all I got to say is proceed with caution. You know, it's, it's Friday night. Yeah, it is Friday night. And, you know, I, I, from, uh, from the bottom of my heart, brother, Ron, thank you for uh, working with me. This was supposed to have taken down at five o'clock this afternoon. Yes. As you can tell by the backdrop here, it's a little later than five o'clock. Yep. So, you know, uh, it's because Brother Ron has some great information and more importantly, he has uh, the proper heart to want to share that information with us. And for that, we are truly, dare I say, blessed. Yep. That's an like honor, man, to be on the Capitol. Oh, yeah. I mean, <clears throat> you know, we had Judge Joe, we had Don Shipley, Larry Rice, Jane Elliott, Daniel Vandora, and the list goes on and on. I don't mean, you know. I, I, we caught a few people in that Venus flat trap. Yes, we have. Yeah, but, so. you know, <laughs> <laughs> you so. know, Brother Ron, what was it like uh, dealing one-on-one -on -one with Dick Gregory? Well, it was, it was a very fascinating um experience a ride or a journey uh you know dick gregory uh i look at him as a as a master master teacher and a master griot a storyteller uh look to interview dick gregory if you ask him one question it'll take him two hours to answer that question. Yes. <laughs> but now you ask him that one question i mean he'll go around the world and you know expose you to things like uh brother patrick you asked me earlier in the day did dick have any successors that he left behind any father's age yes and i'm saying what he told me by him utilizing this new technology it amplified his message mm -hmm. so he exposed a whole generation of people to becoming top provocateurs to not only following people but also doing their own research and learning how to think for themselves. Yes. Yes. And that's what we are here. Yeah. You know, I mean, we give you, you know, I often say, guys, don't even bother doing your research, just watch the show. And I still stand behind that because I know in my heart, and let's be honest, folks, y'all ain't going to do the damn research. All right. So that's why we have <laughs> quality people like Brother Rob and others on to actually uh, do this thing. You know, yeah. and it is truly a, it, it, it's been an amazing work of art to see this thing blossom the way it has. And once again, it's because of you folks out there. It's not us. You know what I'm saying? We're just a couple of guys from Missouri doing our thing. Yeah. You know, some days I don't course. even have no random BS to spew. I don't <laughs> eat. You know, I just, I do. 
So that's why we have to bring on other people because there's people out here that has a lot of valuable information. And this information will be key to your survival as a species. Right. So if you think this is a game, it's not. Now, I was going to show everybody my bug out bag, but I thought better of it because I don't want to get flagged by YouTube or nothing like that. Oh, my God. You know, but, you know, I do, once again, I want to reiterate what Judge Joe Brown has told us. You need a shotgun, you need his pistol, and you need a rifle. You know, uh, the calibers, it, it should vary according to your body weight and your shooting posture, okay? And I also recommend you have an axe and a hunting knife, you know. And once again, as always, you need iodine and antibiotics. Those are going to be very essential. And a herb guide, so you know of uh, different uh, regions in the country. So fake like you said, go to the doctor, get a prescription for antibiotics, get the antibiotics, and then store. Basically, yeah. Now that's illegal, probably. Yeah. But you didn't hear it from us. No. And this is all a hypothetical scenario to begin with. Yeah. Uh, getting legal disclaimer. Yeah. Okay. That works right. right. So, brother Ron, you know, yeah. with our conversation about getting people to actually do the research, you know, where do you think the, the beginning guy or girl, you know, someone who maybe just saw our show, you know, first time a couple months ago, they don't know about, you know, even the Illuminati or anything like that. What could be a good book you could suggest them to read? It kind of, you know, inch them into the water. Oh, um, that's a good question. Um, I, it's kind of interesting you say that. I was thinking about, I would tell people to read some uh, Dr. Claude Anderson. Oh, yeah. Cowanomics. Um, I would tell people to just be open to reading anything and everything that offers uh, any type of perspective. I mean, don't be closed-minded to anything. Be like a sponge and soak it all up. Um, I would say read uh, Secrets of the Federal Reserve. Uh, Have y'all heard of that? No. I couldn't hear you. Yeah, who was the author again? Uh, the Secrets of the Federal Reserve. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, I'm coming I'm coming in clear, right? Yeah, you good. Okay, yeah, The Secrets of the Federal Reserve by Eustace Mullins, who just passed away within the last, I guess, seven years. He was commissioned by Ezra Pound. Uh, Ezra Pound was a... Uh, a literary giant in the, of the 20th century. He actually discovered and mentored some of the greatest writers of the 20th century, like uh, Ernest Hemingway, William Faulkner, T.S. Eliot, and people like that, and F. Scott Fitzgerald. Wow. Uh, he was sad about what happened during World War One. You know, during World War One, there was a lot of loss of human life. Right. You no know, millions of people were killed. And some of the people who were killed were very talented artists. Many of these talented artists was uh, Ezra Pound's friends. So he wanted to know why so many of his friends was killed during World War I. But during World War II, he was in Italy, and he was an expatriate, and he was broadcasting radio from Italy, uh, disrespecting America. You know, <laughs> calling, uh, I guess, Americans really bad people. And Franklin Roosevelt had him thrown in jail. And uh, so he actually was in a mental institution mm -hmm. outside of Washington, D.C. for a number of years. They commissioned Eustace Mullins, a, a Virginian, to write about the history of the Federal Reserve. So wow. Eustace Mullins would go to the Library of Congress and get all these files and documents about the founding of the Federal Reserve. Because a lot of people don't know that the Federal Reserve is not federal, right? Right. right. It's like if, if Beyonce and Jay-Z had a baby and call it Federal Reserve Carter. That's how federal the Federal Reserve is. It's not really federal. It's a private banking entity. Yes. And it came to being because Woodrow Wilson, who was a Democrat, wanted to be president. And he made a deal with the banksters that if he became president, if they helped him win in 1912, he will bring the Federal Reserve into existence by law. Mm. And that's what he did. Because what they did was they brought Theodore Roosevelt out of retirement, who was a Republican. You know, everybody knew that uh, that William Howard Taft was a very popular president, 
he was uh, Teddy Roosevelt's vice president, but uh, he took over after Teddy Roosevelt refused to run for a second term. And so it would have been actually his third term because you know, Teddy Roosevelt took over for William McKinley when he was assassinated. So it would have actually been, I guess, it would been his second term being elected, but it would have been a third term. So William Howard Taft was going to be the winner, but they enticed Teddy Roosevelt to come out of retirement to challenge William Howard Taft for the nomination. And what they did, they split the Republican vote because Teddy Roosevelt formed the Bull Moose Party. And the votes that William Howard Taft would have got with the Teddy Roosevelt which enabled Woodrow Wilson to win the White House. Now, you know, at the end, one of his greatest regrets as president was signing the Federal Reserve into law. Yes, because he knew because he was Because when we got out. the Federal Reserve mm-hmm. into existence, then came the IRS, the income tax and all that stuff. And mm-hmm. so we're still dealing with that to this day. I mean, so you could almost so, yeah. say that Wesley Snipes was a victim of that very scheme. Utilizing the IRS, oh, yeah. yeah, that's how they yeah. use, and that could be it. you, him, yeah, yeah, any of us. Yeah, the IRS is. I think about Joe Lewis. Yep. Whenever they, Joe whenever, Lewis they got, rate, he whenever they raid, whenever they raid, oh, go ahead. No, I'm saying Joe Lewis is sad. What happened to Joe Lewis? Because he was a real American patriot. Like he donated money to the government. He gave a million dollars away to the government. And the government still destroyed him on income tax. Mm-hmm. Like he was doing free boxing matches during World War II. He was a real patriot. He didn't believe in welfare or anything like that. Wow. And they still screwed Joe Lewis over. Because he forgot to realize. See, everyone often says the devil, the greatest trick the devil did was to convince you he doesn't exist. Mm-hmm. Well, the greatest trick right. white supremacy did in Joe's case, was to convince him that they do not exist. Right. You know, even if you help them, you know, you're you're on the honor guard. You're the vanguard. In the end, you're going to be annihilated because yep. you're not a part of the plan. Because mm-hmm. you know? they don't put knives in that. They put axes. Mm. So, yeah, they use the IRS as an uh, enforcement wing. Well, yeah. It, 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 but, you know, this is what I was talking earlier about is the fact that all too often when we're dealing with our government and the po- political structure, as it were, mm-hmm. it's so fakery. It's not real. It's not truly tangible. Oh, I'm going to put a oh, check it in your pot in the car in your driveway. It's <laughs> lies. You know, and people fall for these lies over and over yeah. and over. You know, mm-hmm. it is sad that a lot of our country men and women out there are as smart as a box of rocks. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, and I'm that's a tough on the rocks. <laughs> I'm just being honest. I'm putting my money on the rocks. <laughs> you know, give me that box of rocks. We go. We gonna put a plan together and succeed. No, bro, that's, that's real talk, man. That's real talk for real, man. These people don't get it. People are here stupid. Well, They're willfully ignorant to be stupid. But you gotta understand, and, and this is where I have empathy for people. A lot of us have been so indoctrinated, so forced to believe these concepts, these these out of body constructs that governs our behavior, you know, to such a degree that when you find out that it may not be real or it may not be true or it could have some negative uh, dark stories in its past, a lot of people can't accept that. And they won't accept that because it makes them look foolish and retarded. Because they are foolish and they are, and they are semi-retarded. Which you mean? Oh I mean, you ain't got to be a rocket scientist to figure this shit out. But you like cannot. the fucking government is corrupt because the know? people are corrupt. This is the government of the people. The uh, we watch the uh, we the last president we had in office. We watched the biggest transfer of wealth distribution. He gave all the new income. Hey, 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 promise to, made, promise to the, kept. To the one percent. Yeah, and he promised still people, them that, and it's still people want to get this man autographed. Well. You know, <laughs> come on, man. He can hey, play the sax, but he can sing Amazing Grace like an angel. You know, they can't. They can't even get no. They can't even afford hot dogs with their pork and beans. They can eat pork and beans, and they still want to get this man, this man autograph when he transfer all the wealth. But it's called trickle down. Yeah, you can't trickle down. You know, Trump's gonna make it rain on the American people. You know what I'm saying? 
I guess, I guess they probably are American. Some of them probably are. I don't know. My uh, brother Ron, do you have any opinion on the yes. educational system such as it is? What about the educational system? Like uh, your opinion on it? How can we fix it, or does it even need fixing? We need to start over. It's not, it doesn't mean fixing. It's working the way it's supposed to work. Mm. Uh, unfortunately, he's like mm. Malcolm X said it best. He said, "Only a fool will let their enemies be the primary educators of their children." Yep. What you know, if you let have? your enemy define who you are, I mean, what you expect? I mean, you know, seriously, if you homeschool your children, you're in risk of, you know, so much uh, negative blowback from that. You know what I mean? You, and it, uh, you don't even really got to, you ain't really even got to homeschool them. You just got to tell them the truth when they come home with that bull crap, you know, Christopher Columbus. <laughs> yeah, you know, but they ain't you, need, you know, you need to sit down, you tell your kids the truth, but you also explain to them, that this is the truth, but order to pass this place, you got to go along with the bullshit. So just put this shit down so you can get through what you got to do. Because they don't teach these kids in America to learn. They teach them how to pass a test. Right. So. Right. And listen, guys and girls, this should be the, the writing on the wall. This should be the warning sign. <clears throat> the reason why they're not educating you properly is because the end goal for you isn't to live the picket fence with ham supper it's basically to die and as you're dying oven. you're gonna pay no no with cancer and shit like that and as you're dying you're, you're paying them ones. you're paying them that little chemo money mm -hmm. and they're gonna tap your million dollar life health insurance policy to the million and then you're gonna oh i'm sorry we just gotta hospice you and your peace out yep. all right so <clears throat> when you realize a system can never fail you if it was not designed for you and truly internalize that and understand, then you will start the journey to true critical thinking because you will figure out that you're in big trouble as we all are. You know, those of us will accept this reality and many more of us will once again, willfully deny the, you know, obvious truth right in front of our face. If, if, if you work in 60, 70 hours a week and you still can't pay your bills, how much critical thinking you need to understand that this ain't working? Well, look, if you're, <laughs> if, if you're working that many hours. You, it is. The majority of the people are in this country is, is, there, working, is working these hours. Listen, if you're working that kind of hours and you elect to live in Beverly fucking Hills, when you know you can't not even afford a property tax on your property, dude, that comes. But where's that happening? What do you mean? What does that happen? That's like a handful of people. I'm talking about the average, everyday Mo Joe and whatever you want to call the female. They get up. Mm -hmm. Some of them working two jobs. Some of them working three jobs. But I think people like that are doing just fine economically. It's the people who are waking up, you know, grabbing up the no, sign. No. Hey, you know, I'll fucking work. They making beer. more money than the motherfuckers working 12 hours on the shelf. <laughs> so they say. Man. That's all speculation. You know, when you see the same dusty bum, and that's what they are. You know, they ain't before, dusty bum. I seen the dude go out there with the sign got out of the Impala. Man, stop it. You know, no, I'm, I'm tired serious. of these, these trophy. You know, man, man. man. That's a profession now, begging. <laughs> I seen that shit when I was out in Colorado. I was like, damn, they do this shit back home. They were begging out there, huh? Well, yeah, they was begging with the same bullshit ass signs and some clean, dingy clothes. You know, um, uh, it's funny that you mentioned Colorado. You know, as we uh, go towards the end of this, I guess, marijuana prohibition, hopefully we'll see some social justice come out of this, where we actually see men and women uh, criminal records that were, you know, nonviolent offenses, you know, involving just marijuana, expunged, and, and their rights to vote, uh, once again, reinstated, you know. Good luck with that. I mean, I think that's fair enough. I think it's fair too, but I'm just saying good luck with it. I mean, so brother, if um, mm -hmm. if you had a chance to actually, you know, tell Donald Trump something positive, like he could possibly do with the country, what would it be? I would be uh, abolish student loan debt, get rid of it, abolish yeah. it. 
But I mean, is that really that fundamentally? You know, I mean, fuck, you choose to take the debt. No, man, that you system, know? that system, that system was designed to do, man, they just stole a whole generations, a, a whole generation of kids' wealth before they was even able to right. earn it. Well, doesn't Go Betsy on. DeBoss so, have some so that means, finger in there? So that means that generation's done. You know who they, you know who they working on now? They working on our kids' money. They finna steal that money. It's well, more. It's more student loan debt than any other debt in this country can buy. It's but, more student. Yes, it is. I mean, no, I'm, I'm yeah. not. I'm not just being uh, a record yeah. there. But I'm saying that if you and choose, well, people got, well, huh? Well, people got to understand about student loan debt. When well, you got to understand that people always talk about the 1960s and all this social justice movement and all this stuff they were doing. The reason why the young people were able to get to get involved. In those movements back in the sixties, because they were coming out of school, they didn't have student loan debt. Yeah, because you basically go to school for free at places like UCLA, where Judge Joe Brown went to school at. This is before Ronald Reagan became governor of California, and then everything changed. Mm. Um, this country is twenty-one trillion dollars in debt. Ooh, uh, America has never paid what it owes. Donald Trump is a mirror to America. He has never paid what he owes. He is a trust fund baby. He mm -hmm. is a product of corporate welfare. His family fortune was subsidized by the federal government. So everybody, ain't no such thing as you pull yourself up by your bootstraps mm -hmm. and make it on your own. Right. That's one of the great... You can't become a president while having that trust fund. Yeah. That's one of the that's one of the greatest lies ever told in this country. Yeah. Pulling yourself up by self determination. You can you're not gonna get anywhere without somebody's help in this country. They're gonna you're gonna that's need right. somebody to put you on. That's a that's all across this whole planet. Yeah. yeah. There's there's no magical <laughs> lucky fucking charm with unicorns and fucking you know, oh I'm just a dumb shoe worker. No, that this is bullshit. It's designed to keep the worker fucking head down. Oh, one day I'll be rich. That's why I'm a Republican. All this stupid ass rhetoric. When we can make things right, right now, folks, we have the power to do it right now, not tomorrow. Let me tell you, I mean, let, me let me put this on y'all mind too. You think Queen Elizabeth knows how to clean her toilet? <laughs> no. Some, some of the wealthiest people on the planet, listen to me well, some of the wealthiest people on the planet never had a job. You got some of the poorest people in the planet got more than five jobs and they still poor. Yeah. You tell me That's about what I'm that? saying. Yeah. I the think, of the world is in poverty under this system. Yeah, but that's the, 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 once again, that is the causation and effect of the system's mechanics. Capitalism don't work. Together, they had that in mind. Yeah. They had her in Cap mind, not you. Right. Capitalism her. doesn't even work without poor people. It doesn't work yep, without poor. <laughs> yeah, you have to Yeah, because a, a person that's got a lot of money, they don't they don't spend a lot of money. Why would some just because I got a billion dollars don't mean I need twenty cars? No, but mm -hmm. and also when you have that kind of money, you're always getting free shit. Here, try this out. Right. Maybe you'll buy it. Here, try this tractor out. Maybe you'll buy. All right, you always get shit thrown at you, but you gotta understand the game, kids. You know, I'm talking to the young people. You older folks. You know, I, I hate to be brutally honest, but you're already out the game and you're already on your way to the graves. And that's just what it is. Now, but the younger people, <laughs> the ones who can actually affect change, guys, it is totally up to you. Please, you know, don't be like your, your older, you know, uh, siblings or your mother and father. Don't be lazy. Get and learn this information. Read these books and actually internalize this information. And, you know, we're working... I'm personally working very hard to create a network where we can plug each other into and really affect a global change. Because the fourth right is live and well in this great state of the United States. Well, it's 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 it's, it's more like Hydra tentacles in all countries. I mean, you have no, racist no, ass no. Koreans. You can't a... go into certain Korean bars because they got Korean bars where? in Korea. Oh, South Korea. Okay. okay, I thought you were talking about over here. I was like, no, it's like cool. wherever our GIs went, not only did they bring spam and fucking the American flag, they also brought good old fashioned American racism. Yeah. You know, so oh. you got to be aware of that internationally. 
Yeah. Yeah, they get that shit out for well, free. I mean, it, because it serves a purpose. It serves a purpose. Yeah, because they need all. You them. know, a lot of people think that white supremacy is about a guy um, with some sort of, you know, uh, swastika or better flag. It's not. But now those are obvious representations of it. But it's more subtle in some respects than that. It may be simply as internalizing Columbus sailed the ocean blue in uh, 1492. That, as if that is the truth. That's why when they come around with them scanners, there's a lot of people that be, you know, flying them little hate flags and the little swastikas and stuff. When they do that, when they do that scanner, they be like, oh, to the oven. Because they have the one drop rule. <clears throat> you know it. Yeah. You know it. That's got to be 100% pure. There was a, uh, there was a guy, a German guy, uh, Adolf Eichmann, I believe, and didn't he somehow co- co- uh, get the Jews to basically march themselves into the oven? If you did march the stop, the, the stop over was going around you with the SS troopers anyway. So, you know. No, no, it, it was deeper than that because if, if they would have fought back, a lot more would have possibly been saved. It's better to fight. It, it truly is. If you're going to die anyway. Well, not just that you're gonna die. It's about living. You're gonna live anyways. So don't live. But I'm saying, if you don't fight, you're gonna die. If you fight, you're gonna die. So I'm gonna rather fight because I might have a chance of survival. If I don't put up a fight, it's just right to the other. Well, or, or the other gas showers or whatever else. Is, don't forget the know, sweat forms. You know, you whatever know. else sick shit they was doing back then. So now, brother Ron. Uh, can you yeah. tell us a little bit about your new research that you're doing? Um, I'm always doing stuff like, come on, let me see. Like, it's this thing about Confederate statues in this country, which is very fascinating. This uh, thing about taking down Confederate flags and Confederate statues. A statue never committed police brutality, as far as I know. Mm. Uh, a, a statue has never committed acts of terrorism uh, against a group of people. Um, right now, what we're doing, because my, my group, we all be group incorporated, we're not just a, a podcast or we blog. We're a nonprofit organization. We're a 501c3. Oh, good. And we do work in the community. Well, where can people donate and, to your um, cause? Do you have a website that they can donate? Uh, yeah, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I think I'm basically, um, let me see. You uh PayPal, you can look up uh my my email, r2c2h2 at gmail dot com. Um I on my videos on We All B T V on YouTube, we have links where people can go to support, uh donate. Uh all donations are tax deductible. And uh there's other ways you can do as well too. Like I got a website, r two c two h two dot com. That people go on, they can buy art and things of that nature. But what we're doing right now on Juneteenth, on June 19th, yeah. which is known as Juneteenth, you know, that's when the uh, slaves in Texas found out that they were free on June 19th, 1865, down to Galveston, Texas. Mm-hmm. We're going to do a, a historic marker unveiling at the Memphis National Cemetery for the victims of the Four Pillow Massacre during the Civil War. This was a massacre that was led by Confederate General Nathan Bethel Forrest, who was the first Grand Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan. He massacred 300 U.S. colored troops, women and children at Four Pillow in Hennon, Tennessee. It was the massacre. And so what we're going to do, we found the, the, uh, the grave plot of the victims of Nathan Bethel Forest in Memphis National Cemetery about two years ago. Mm. So we're going to put a marker to honor the ancestors who, who remains are buried there. It's going to be a big event uh, Tuesday, June 19th. That's June 10th. Uh, Memphis, Tennessee at the Memphis National Cemetery at 10 a.m. Central. Awesome. That's what we're doing. And um, we also be live streaming that on your YouTube channel. Yeah, we plan on live streaming on YouTube and doing some other things as well, but it will be documented. And that's what I want to tell people too. Like, this is why platforms like the other morning show, what y'all doing, Brother Patrick and Brother Dimebag, 
this is very important that we amplify what we want to see. We can't leave it up to our enemies and people that don't right. give a damn about us to tell our story from our perspective. We need you guys to do what you're doing. We also need the village to support what you're doing. Yes. We got to yeah. start supporting what we want and what we need. Yes. It's so important right now. It's so vital. Mm -hmm. It's called <clears throat> unity. We really need unity more than ever. And what I mean by unity is yes. actually the helping hand. You know, not some scornful words, you know, some stupid pundit rhetoric to try to degrade people into shaming them to do right. No, you lead by example. Yes, you know, you actually reach out to brothers and teach them or sisters and teach them certain aspects to this life, which you're an expert on. You because know? A, uh, a <coughs> decision, the citizens of slaves in this country need a, a, a economic foundation. That's mm -hmm. a, We need that bad. That is... People don't that's crucial. Uh, people don't understand how how pivotal that is. That's like that should be at least one, two on your on the list. Mm -hmm. Because that's that's gonna be one of the most powerful tools we have to get justice for everyone. Or if not if not an uh, economic uh, uh situation, seriously. Uh, if, if you don't have no resources, it's going to be you. a hard resource. If, if, to if you don't have any resources, it's very easy to go in there and take you out. No, absolutely. Without resources, absolutely. And you and you do it with a smile. Now, brother Ron, this is a very weird, weird question. I always ask everybody this, but um, do you have any opinions on UFOs? Do you believe in them? Do you not believe in them? Uh, do you think they're bacteria or sentient beings? What do you think? I believe like this. There are more things we don't know than we know. Mm. There are more things that we do not know than we know. Knowledge is very limited. The knowledge, the things that we know are very limited. And they always change when new information becomes available. Right. Over 100 years ago, people did not believe mountain gorillas existed. White folks did not believe mountain gorillas were real. No. They thought the natives were crazy. Wait, wait, wait! Mountain. And gorillas. then they saw. Yeah, they didn't believe the mountain. They didn't believe in mountain gorillas. I'm talking about the white people, the white man. Oh, I got you. He thought the natives were making up fairy tales about mountain gorillas. I mean, you ever heard of this called cryptozoology? Y'all know what cryptozoology is, right? I've heard of it. Yeah, you study animals that no longer exist or that people thought never existed. And they discover new species of animals every day. Look but, how deep the ocean is. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. There's oh, no yeah. telling what is down there. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Something really it's like I said, so, And our UFO is, is the simple definition of a UFO is unidentified flying object. There's a lot of stuff I see up in the sky I can't identify, so. Right, and it's moving and shit. I don't know what it is. Well, some of those are satellites, so, but okay, <clears throat> and you know weather balloons. But is that is there a thing about some type of black satellite that's been out there for ages? Oh, people saying the Black Knight. There's mm -hmm. an ancient satellite, yes. the Black Knight. Okay. Yes. Oh, yes. Um, and you know what? This goes back to, you know, this little hypothesis I, I've been working on myself, like. What if in actuality, all of humanity was once a super advanced race? All right. We actually traveled through the stars, you know, and we, we were doing our thing. We came across some, some entity that was way more powerful than us, basically destroyed our fleets, subjugated us, threw us down here on this mud ball, kind of de-evolved us a little bit. And now this is where we're at. Mm -hmm. You know. And I just did not plagiarize that from Halo. Which okay. Is, that is, well, you know what? Your, Einstein said it best. Einstein said that your imagination is more powerful than knowledge. Mm. You got to have imagination to visualize an alternative way. Because if you believe that all black folks were just slaves, you believe that black history starts with slavery, so that fool. means you have a very limited imagination. Yes. And getting back to homeschool, See, if you don't understand what school is versus your home, knowledge of stuff does not come from school. It comes from the home. You learn about who you are at home. Right. If your people do not know who they are and where they come from, then you're screwed. Because you don't get that from school. 
School okay. teach you how to deal with the system. It teach you how to do multiplication and reading and writing. Knowledge yourself comes from your home, from your people. If your people do not have a clue about who they are and where they come from, then they have no clue about where they're going. Exactly. So that was knowledge yourself. People confuse school with knowledge. I be hearing parents all the time, how come they didn't teach y'all about yourselves in school? Because like Malcolm said, only a fool will let their uh, primary educators of their children be the enemy. Mm. Only a fool would do that. And a lot of us have been foolish. A lot of us have been foolish. Oh, extremely foolish. You know, because, you know, when you think about it, a lot of times, you know, you get these cult type people, you know, oh, you know, bring us to I'm our school. Trying. And the next thing you know, they're raping <laughs> the fucking kids. You know what I mean? So it's sort of mm-hmm. like, because a lot of us actually have to work. You know, a lot of physically be there with the children, you know, they have to send them to school. I mm-hmm. get it, all right? But like Dimebag said, when they do come home, at least take the time out and say, hey, little, you know, kid, do these couple of things, blah, blah, blah. But some of us don't even do that because, let's face it, they're lazy, they're tired, they're uninterested. You know, th- th- let's be honest. A lot of you parents out there don't give a damn. You know, you guys don't uh, mm-hmm. play ball with the kids. You guys don't uh, discipline the children. You don't uh, really interact. And that's very sad because, you know, when you grow, when they grow up and you grow older and they're never going to be around you because they really don't know who the fuck you are, you have no one else to blame. When that little orderly up there in the nursing home has his finger in your rectum, and he's giving you a prostate exam off the record. You have no one to explain uh, to. Um, and he a temp janitor too. Oh my god! <laughs> oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but the problem, the, the point is, you know, you can call it karma, which I don't believe in. But uh, you know, it seems like what comes around inevitably goes around. I just think the whole That's education, the, law, yeah. the whole education system in this country needs to be just scrapped. Well, like Van Jones says, though, oh, it, you know, in, in, order, in order to say a statement like that, what do you have to replace the, the current system with? You have to replace it with something. Give me like two days. I can probably come up with something better than what we got now. So like with the Federal Reserve issue, guys, you know, don't fall prey to the sweetness of the ear, because we have to have a tangible situation that we can go immediately to. We can't be in economic limbo, or else we will totally just descend into pure chaos. You got to start cutting the profit margins out. You got to take profit out of everything. But now you sound like a communist. No, that's I scary. Sound like, no, man, please, these people know what the fuck's going <laughs> on, man. I ain't got time to hear. Oh, you a socialist? No, this is just common sense. If I'm paying, uh. Fucking four hundred four hundred dollars a month on a premium for my insurance, but I only see my doctor once a year because I'm fairly healthy. Yeah. And why can't that money that I'm paying? You don't have in, to do it now. You you know you no, have to do it. as soon as I get rid of that crappy ass insurance, I'm gonna get sick. And as long as I keep it, I'm gonna be healthy. But anyway, what I'm saying <laughs> is all this money I'm paying all this money I'm paying a month. I'm not even using it. I'm not even using this part. Why can't that money go to help somebody else? It is. It's going to help the insurance executives and their secretaries. Not them. <laughs> oh, so now you want to pick and choose who helps with your money? Damn right. <laughs> I earned that. Uh, it don't work like it that. Wouldn't, that wouldn't give it you. You don't earn money. it. The moment you handed that off to those people, they own it. They earned it. It, it, it just just certain things in this country should just be free. Be no, no, ain't nothing for free. It's a price to pay for everything to an extent. But but see that type like, of behavior right there is why we have whores on the streets sucking dick because of the fact that the economic situation is that bad. I think things should be free. Be I think everybody in America here. should be entitled to a house. They should be entitled to electricity and water. Anything above that is on you, buddy. Or or just do it like this. The, uh, the, the reason why you have your land. The corporations that's over here raping this 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 country, this land of its natural resources. Yeah. The they need to start seas. compensating the citizens because they have a claim to those uh resources too. 
Okay, now we're starting to sound, you know, kind of communist once again. No, this ain't communist. This is common fucking sense. The, 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 those people no reason, buy those resources. Man, buy you, the why, why should you, you shouldn't have to buy that stuff. That makes no sense. You and got, then how do you got politicians people politicians going to get their money? The hell with these politicians. They ain't number whores anyway. They cheap whores too. Yeah, I know, that, but that's why the, the, the corporations man, are there's no over. reason why people should be working 60, 70 hours a week. Well, what people, else should they be doing? Fucking spending time with their families, you know, doing something way more productive. You don't need a freaking guy cooking fries. Get the machine to cook them on nasty-ass McDonald's fries. It's going to make your chick fat, and it's the difference between fat and thick. That's <laughs> uh, <laughs> all it's going to do, man. You know, you just sit up there wasting human potential. Look, we, should, we should only have to probably work about 20 hours a week. This is not Sweden. This ain't Sweden, dude. This is America. And in America, you're going to work till the day you die. You know why? Because your daddy did before him. His daddy did before him. And they all, you know what they all had in common? They were fucking idiots. That's why they did that shit. Period. <laughs> See, I'm just, I'm just telling you how it, it's enough resources in this country where everybody's basic needs could be met. Period. But there's and too somebody, many lazy somebody, people. Man, it ain't too many goddamn you lazy. Know, it's people who working four or five jobs. How you gonna be lazy working four or five jobs? But those are rare, yeah. man. man Most people right. are working a damn system. Let's be honest. It's Straight you know, up. you know how many people that's just getting money from the system and working a full time job. Well, a few, I'm sure. But you gotta understand, you know. Yeah. Look, we're in a situation now, folks. You know, Brother Ron just told us we're twenty-one trillion dollars in the hole, guys. Seriously, that means that they want to straight up repo America, take our shoes, our hats, you know, uh, sex toys, whatever. That's not going to come oh, to the bill. Man. Oh, this is going to be some motherfuckers mad. They come become sex robots. <laughs> I just bought that second hand. <laughs> Damn, boy, nasty. Really? We're kind of deprived, and, and, and I'm not trying to be holier than thou, but damn it, sex is meant for man and woman one on one. Sex is whatever, at the bare minimum, sex is meant between human beings, not human and animals, not human and tree, and certainly not human and metal and rubber. You know, come on, man. I mean, think about it. You go to a brothel, right? A, a robot brothel, oh, and you punch in the code. And you're like, I don't know, you go there in your lunchtime, that means that robot's probably been on duty for 14, 15 hours. You know, I know janitors personally, <laughs> and they don't clean for shit. You know, and, and, okay, look, I'm going to pay you 10 bucks an hour. Now you put your hand in there and scrape out that jizz in the vaginal cavity. Yeah, but somebody on they could do the same thing. No, the pussy's a self-cleaning oven. No, get the fuck It is. It's, it really <laughs> 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 That's why it's made for human consumption. I guess. In, or not consumption. Oh. We don't eat pussy. Oh, but. I'm saying it's, it's a lot of people that like they sex robots. I think they're people. disgusting dweebs. I, I really do. I, I think you're you're fucking sick. Man, nobody got time to be hearing no mouth all the goddamn time. You just man, you can't punch no R two D two. You done. You done. Right? done to be done. Uh, nobody don't uh, talk to me. Just moaning, bro. <laughs> oh, <laughs> hey, oh, Danny, uh, uh, and then he gets a virus. Oh, you're not as you know, good as the fucking. When you been that sex robot, robot over all they say on on her back, you know they got that tramp stamp. Oh my god, it says size does matter. So depending on the sound she make, on depends on your size. Yeah, that is nasty, dude. <laughs> you just do what you gotta do and just call her there and put her ass back in the closet, put that plug that put that in, in a box and have a closet. Put that charger up and be good to go, man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's just this you we just gotta up. take everybody's fun away. That's fucked up. I mean, I'm not trying to be buzzkill, guys. But it's time to be He's serious. Lying. He is trying it's to be time. <laughs> <laughs> It's time to be serious, guys. You know, playtime's over. We got to get serious with it because people are definitely serious about their agenda. All right. You know, I mean, uh, a lot of folks aren't prepping at all. You know, how many of you guys seriously show of hands have enough food and water underneath your house for at least, you know, 48 days? Show of hands. Anybody oh. other than myself. <laughs> wow. This, this is what I'm talking about. You're just begging. I thought you only had to have like t enough food for ten days. 
Man, you better have You know, after that 10 days, you know, half the population been killed themselves anyway because they retarded. Speaking of that, Brad Ryan, have you heard about the uh, increase in um, uh, suicides? Yeah, supposedly, yeah. <laughs> supposedly. But you don't I think mean, those numbers fake are news, right? Fake news. I'm joking. I'm just joking. <laughs> it's weird, though, man. I don't know if y'all have social media timelines, but everybody's talking about their suicide, near-death experiences today and things. One out of every three person on my timeline is talking about their own little near-death experiences with suicide. It is the programming is real. The programming is real, man. Yeah, man, so man. you think it's so it's almost like the lemon effect. You know, one motherfucker's jumping mm-hmm. off the cliff. I think it's I think once again, I think we have an epidemic, not an opioids, but of attention whoring. <laughs> you know, seriously, just uh-huh. attention whoring to the max. You know, it's like, oh shit, I gotta get my fix, you know. Oh, oh, I burnt myself with hot baking grease this morning. And I'll type that shit, right. expect it. Oh, God. And then get bad when the one, the one person on there be like, well, you should have had all the proper equipment yeah. handling the, the, the baking grease or right. whatever. Or and take they get back. pissed off. Yeah. yeah. That's a part of the, that's part yeah. of the attention of her. You know? And look at me. I just gave some homeless guy two nickels. Yeah. <laughs> After I stepped over him to go in the Walmart, and then I stepped over him after I came out of the Walmart, and I just happened to turn around and had two nickels going. Well, I thought you were going into Starbucks, you know, but I heard they. Oh no, they they let the people out of Starbucks. <laughs> well, you're supposed to be able to use Starbucks, folks. I heard that Starbucks is supposed to be like a public bathroom center now. You know, you can go in there. I I would hate to be the guy who has to clean those bathrooms though. That'd just be disgusting, cause you public, y'all some nasty motherfuckers, man. The public is nasty. You ever been to like a rock concert, mm. rap concert? That's why I tell my son when he go in the public bathrooms, I'll be like, "Don't touch nothing. Your little pecker is cleaner than this bathroom. Yeah. You just go in there, do what you got, spray whatever, and just go." <laughs> spray. Oh my god! I I remember one time I was travel traveling to Tunica, Mississippi. I was going down there to gamble, spend a few, you know, a few money. I stopped off at this gas station. In, I think it was a 76 down south, uh, uh, yellow. And uh, I went to the restroom, dude. And whoever took the time to actually uh, take their hand with oh. feces <laughs> and smear it on the mirror <laughs> like, like a death, like, oh, they got me. And, 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 oh, my God, it's so cringy, dude. The toilet paper all had their hand print, like, where they unrolled it. You could tell it was all lumpy and, and oddly shaped. Yeah, can we not talk about that? Now, I'm just saying that. That's why I say the, 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 the people out here are some nasty folks, man. I, I just got to. I'm not going to say no stories, you know, like, you know, the sandwich maker and shit cause another epidemic. But uh, I will say there are some nasty folks out here for certain. No, I know a few myself. It's trifling. Yeah. <laughs> we don't want that. We don't want that. Go ahead, man. Well, I, uh, there's really uh, not a whole lot more. And but... Brother Ross still on the phone? Yeah, he's still yeah, here. I'm yeah, okay. he's still here. Hey, I mean, I know, but there's one thing I do want, Brother Ross. Can you uh, do a little trumpet huh? for us? Can you do a little trumpet for us? I don't, I don't have my trumpet with me right now. Man. Oh. I'm just sitting out here um, uh, chillaxing with you all. But the suicide thing is interesting because I know y'all know about all these black folks they find hanging from trees at Super yes. Walmart yep. and off bridges at Morris Brown University. I mean, I don't know if black folks really commit suicide by hanging I, themselves. I don't know about that. That's not I Especially when you never see a, a, a ladder or anything in the yeah. Um, in well, the, how to tie those weird knots like the Boy Scout knots in the rope? Well, I don't know how to tie a knot like that. You know, no. <laughs> I don't see how you're black. No, because oh. that doesn't interest us. I just don't think black folks that go commit suicide. I don't think hanging is going to be the method of choice. Right, and it's like normally okay. you don't see people commit suicide by burning themselves to death. You know what I'm saying? Mm. You don't. I mean, mm-hmm. it's very rare, like in Vietnam, right. the, the monk, you know, doing that for a political. But no, normally people are going to drown themselves. They're going to take pills, or else they're going to get shot by either a cop or or themselves. All right. So, you know, I think a lot of it is 
natural selection. You know, these guys know that mm-hmm. they're genetically uh, inferior to the majority of us. And it's almost like an act of mercy. I'm not trying to justify their act at all. But it's like an act of mercy. They, they know that they don't need to be sending their genes down the way. So they do the correct thing and end their shit. Yeah, I heard about the a lot of white males are committing suicide. Yeah, white middle age, white white middle age males are committing suicide. They suicide <laughs> rate is off the charts. Well, you just did on everything I mm. said after what you guys just said. You but, kind of doing the right thing. Before is that before is that 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 one chick that was hung up there at that Walmart in, in Georgia. That tree that mm-hmm. tree had been maintained. It was no branches for probably about. 10 to 15 feet before you got to the first branch on 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 the tree from what from the videos i seen. but think about it, if you was in a jacked up pickup truck and she was in the back you can easily set her up man with that body weight limp you at least need two people no i'm talking about you have her in a big old monster truck in the in the bed, bed right mm-hmm. you throw the rope up there you and her buddy you smack you know he's raping her smacking her around and then you throw the rope and you can put her on the back of that bed and then when he drives off she'll go flying out the back and they're, voila, you don't have no ladder, you know, because I'm not buying that she's some sort of fucking, you know, excuse the deal here, some sort of like monkey can just shim me up a tree and then, you know, with rope in hand, you know, you what I'm like saying? on your neck too. Yeah, you come know, on, man. That's, 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 that's too much work, man. That's too much that's work. That's yeah. insulting yeah. to such a degree. But a lot of people have been suggesting that. And I know where that's I wouldn't be that's, surprised. Hey, that's not this. Roseanne. So, I mean, y'all telling shit. me this video of her there's video of her hanging herself or no try to hang her what what okay. from the video the, the, the new I, I saw some videos from the local news coverage down there and they were showing like the tree and stuff and they had a, uh, it was basically like they local news broadcast i was watching the video of that story through that through the local oh, news the down there tree. okay and they was talking about that's how i seen the tree now, and all the other people stuff. does she have not have people in that region Oh, I'm pretty sure I don't know. They didn't say anything about it, but I just know if you black down there, you need to watch your back. Well, yeah. honestly, if you're black, yeah. we know interesting. So where's the uh, tree? That happened in Walmart parking lot, right? Yeah. And where are the cameras? But where's the video footage? They got video cameras in the world. I mean, it's super Walmart, right? It's a big Walmart, right? Right. Half the time, the cameras don't even work. Around. Well, yeah, so, they should have had, but a lot of stores don't have security guards. Uh, driving around, mm-hmm. especially in like a rural situation. But um, once again, I think a lot of those videos are are actually directed or, or guided by somebody in a control room. So they might have been looking at something else. Wow, old girl. Now, she wasn't, uh, do we know if she was um, uh, uh, sexually assaulted or anything? Or was they didn't say. Uh, All they said that the police said that she committed suicide. And I was looking at the tree and I'm like, no. Well, that's just now. Listen now, the the the, the government Man, has been no known for the hang itself. The government has been known to say that people have committed suicide by multiple gunshot wounds to the head, not just one, but pow, pow, pow. You know, come on, it don't work like that. You know, you know, get one mother get popped in the head. They're like, well, they're done, mm, right? All right, yeah. we're fools. We are straight up fools, people. You guys believe the most stupidest, outlandish bullshit, and you roll with it. And it's, it's so sad. It's so fucking sad. Mm. Well, I mean, what can you do? Well, what can you do? You can expose people like Joe Osteen for being a little fucking, you know, lucky charms in a box. But when it starts flooding, no, y'all can't come up in here. That's what you can do. You can start exposing. Because they had to make sure that something was open that Sunday so they get that money. Mm. Well, you don't want the smell of the um, wash up there in the No, nah, we don't need mm. all them peasants up in there. Okay. We need people coming out with money. Also, they need that cash. They just think it's a game. Of but, you know, I heard he's done some wonderful things for the community. I bet he has. You know, he's probably done the Eddie Long thing. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and I'm not trying to, to bash on Eddie Long. Because I think those are unsubstantiated allegations. But they all be doing a little nasty stuff. Well... They all do. There's a guy. His name is Reverend Jesse Peterson. All right. Um, mm-hmm. Self-professed coon. Uh, wears it as a badge of honor. You know, I think it's, I hope it's just an act and he's just playing. A brilliant man. You know, you can tell he's, he's smart. 
But it's like, why are Christians producing such a horror people? You know, you're going to have this guy, you know, basically raping boys, you know, and everyone looks up to him. You can have another guy out here, you know, when the people need him the most, shut his doors and basically piss on them. And then the, the icing, I guess, on the proverbial cake, you're going to have a guy talking about, yeah, I like to be with young black boys because they don't have no daddy. And I'm going to I'm gonna show them how to be a dad using that old black ass rap to basically rip off some boy's booty. That's some bullshit. Yeah, that was uh, Brother Patrick and Brother Dimebag. It was my first time on the uh, the other morning show. And I, I didn't realize, this is my first time watching it in like over two years. It's been two years, going on three, which is crazy. And I didn't realize all the suicide talk that we had. It's kind of foreboding. It's kind of weird to look at it, like knowing what I know. But, you know, like it's weird because I know some of y'all said, well, y'all couldn't see him doing that, but. It's people that I know committed suicide that I thought would never commit suicide. Like I had an uncle Willie James. Uncle Willie James was like a, like the life of the party. He was very gregarious. Had a, a loud oh boy. <laughs> Everybody loved Uncle Willie James. I mean, he'll come over for the holidays and be telling jokes and laughing. Then I remember uh, Mother's Day. It had to be Mother's Day, twenty eleven. He was on my aunt's house, and he's just being Willie James. I mean, life of the party, laughing, very positive outlook on life. And then the next month, we had the doctor office with him. He was going like a shell of his former self, like he's seen a ghost. I mean, he's in a wheelchair. Doctor gave him a prognosis saying that, hey, you got this rare form of cancer. Within a year of time, you'll need 24-hour nursing care. And this was a guy that was used to you know, going, traveling around the country, and just living his life. You know, and then um, it was a Friday. 
And I remember him saying, oh, you Ron, you going to see me this weekend? I said, Uncle, I'll try to make it over here again. He just had this look in his eye. And I know that Monday morning we get a call to my Uncle Willie James dead. You know, he shot himself in his bed. He bled out over the night. You know, um, he had other folks living in the house with him. One of our cousins kind of like, well, the cousin, he really like an introvert type of, you know, he'll be the type of dude that will stay in his room doing Christmas and Thanksgiving. Everybody be out there eating food and, uh, net, you know, and uh, fellowship. And he'll be in the room in the dark with the TV on. And, you know, you wouldn't know he was in the room. He was so quiet. Then I remember that day when uh, Willie James committed suicide. This man was talking to everybody like he trying to establish an alibi. So I'm like, hey, everybody here, I'm here. Yeah, I was. I, this is my time stamp, and <laughs> it's great. But you know, when my with his uncle with the James died, that was a dog, like a pit bull or something that came down the street, and uh, like the cops were kind of afraid of the dog, but the dog was trying to attack anybody. It was just there. It was like it was there. It sensed something, and it walked away or whatever. I mean, like it's weird. These connections with animals with my my people. Like both my that was my great uncle, my my maternal grandfather's youngest uh sibling. And um yeah, nobody ever thought he would commit suicide. And the thing about it is he left a note. You know, I don't know if Patrick left a note, you know, which is interesting. My uncle left a note, but shit, it was like chicken scratch. He he was a, a gospel singer. I wish he would have sung the note into a tape recorder or something. Or record a song about a suicide he was going to do. I we couldn't read, we couldn't make ins or outs of what he was trying to, you know, confess or write about in the note. I mean, the cops held the note and then they gave it back, but we couldn't read the damn thing. You know, I uh, mean, he rest in peace, Uncle Willie James. I mean, it is what it is. You know, I had a friend two years ago; her brother committed suicide uh, with a gun. My uncle Willie James used a gun as well. You know, he bled out in his bed. Um, my other friend, her, my good friend, her brother committed suicide. Her only sibling. He shot himself in the bed, too, and bled out in the bed because she, he was, uh, she was the last person that he spoke to. You know, like she, you know, you know how you go about your day, you ain't paying attention. Because a lot of times when people, when they're about to commit suicide, they're not going to tell you. Oh, uh, I'm about to commit a suicide by the way. You want to stop me? Because once a person decides to commit suicide, they're not trying to tip their hand. They're not going to let you know because they want to go through with it. Like they may, may have been the most indecisive person their whole life. And then they decide to commit suicide. It's like, I'm resolute. I'm going to follow through. Because a lot of times, the people that want to tell you they're going to commit suicide, they want attention. They don't really want to kill themselves. I know people like that. <laughs> that they'll I'm going to kill myself. It's not that Because they want attention. But if a person gonna commit suicide, they're not trying to let you know they're gonna do it. They're just gonna do it. So her brother, she spoke to her brother last. She was the last person her brother spoke to on his life, as far as we know. And she was the one to discover his body in his bedroom. He was cold as ice. Because she went to work and came back that day. She was devastated. Has not ever recovered from that. That was like, it'll be three years ago this year. This dude killed himself. After, say, turning 30, 25 days after turning 30. I think his birthday was March the 3rd. Then he killed himself 25 days later. I wish him happy birthday on Facebook. I had no idea. So the guy was very uh, bright. He was a very smart dude. Very much like a biblical scholar. We used to have these deep philosophical conversations. But I didn't know all the, the torment and pain and hurt he was going through. Neither did she. She just always thought that he's going to be around. And she does... She got her own health ailments she's dealing with. So she feel guilty. I said, but you got your life. You're dealing with a lot of health ailments. And I mean, it's not your job to know everything about everybody. You know, I know that's your brother. That was your only sibling. And, you know, it just really pained the family that he would do that. Because commit suicide is such a hurtful act for the survivors. You know, I know the person who might have done it or do it, they may be at peace. But it, it's really like it hurts the family. It hurts the parents. It hurts the siblings, the loved ones. Because, I mean, like, you you thinking that I, I, I feel guilty because this person killed themselves. How come I didn't notice the signs? I mean, because you live in life and you got a lot of stuff you're dealing with. Because a lot of us dealing with stuff we don't share with everybody, including our most intimates, right? So, 
he didn't leave no message. I mean, this guy was very articulate dude. He didn't leave nothing behind. He was in the military at one point. I think he was dealing with PTSD or something like that. I don't know. But uh, he's gone. And he was just 30 years young. He said enough was enough. And so he didn't leave a note as far as they know. They didn't find anything. So because normally people that do kill themselves, they normally leave some type of form of communication, allegedly. Remember, I had a friend of mine, her uh, niece went to prom for a dude. This is up in New Jersey, I think. He ended up jumping out the Empire State Building the next day. Like her niece went to prom with this guy. He ended up jumping out the Empire State Building the next day. And she blamed herself. And then a month and up in a and and my friend was trying to tell her, look, it ain't your fault. I mean, it's your fault, excuse me, because he already had his mind. He's gonna kill himself. Maybe this was like an act, like by you. It was on his bucket list. He wanted to take you to the prom, whatever. I don't know what goes on with people, man. People are, and you don't really know a person as well as you think that you do. You look at serial killers. You know, you always look at the news. People say, well, they said like that was normal. Um, uh, you know what I'm saying? Like, you look at serial killers, but more like Ted Bunny than you do like a Michael Jackson. You know, people are like, oh, Michael Jackson look weird and stuff. No, nah, serial killers like Ted Bundy and Jeffrey Dahmer, they look normal looking people. I remember I met a woman who I think used to work at the chocolate factory that Jeffrey Dahmer worked at up in, Min in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. You know, he used to work at a candy factory, a chocolate candy factory, I think. And they said he used to have happy hour over his apartment. I said, wait a minute. And these are, she's a black woman. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. So y'all didn't notice anything. Y'all go to his apartment and have beers. Y'all didn't have no weird smelling, feeling, or some weird thing that was off. He said, no, nah, we couldn't tell nothing. You know, like most of his victims, a lot of his victims were black gay males. You know, he was like, you know, Ed Buck, before there was an Ed Buck, but I don't think Ed Buck ate his victims. You know, but Jeffrey ate his. But um, he just don't know about people. It's hard to tell. So with Patrick, I just I didn't know we was talking about suicide, like we was on that heavy. Like this is my first time seeing that interview. I just posted, hey, this is one first one I did with him, but I didn't know we was talking about suicide that heavy. Hmm. Yeah. There's a lot of y'all, y'all very active in the chat. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Wow, yeah. A lot to deal with. But uh, it is a little bit. I played my little trumpet, Saints Go March, and I, I didn't have my trumpet. Actually, I was like, well, I did that interview. I was like outside this 24-hour gym. I didn't have a place to stay. I was like, you know, my little living out my car type of existence. <laughs> That's another story. <laughs> So I was doing an interview. I was like, you know, apologize for all that noise, but I was like in my car, you know, ain't no place to go. Just stayed in my car. You know, that was an interesting period, 2018. But, you know, life goes on. And uh, so, I want Patrick, brother, you will be missed. Thank you for holding on on as long as you did brother and to gift us with these interviews for posterity uh you would never be forgotten about me i lost a lot of people over the years a lot of good people a lot of good brothers man it's hard for black men sometimes to exist in the world that does not allow them to exist in on their terms you know what i'm saying like i knew a lot of great brothers who checked out here early uh unfortunate situation now all about suicide but this i think about marcus jones so often the brother who's the father of michael bell of the Gen six i mean i didn't know he was dead for three years almost until after baba dick gregory passed you know and he was the one that tried to connect me with dick gregory and so i mean he got killed a crazy way got ran over by a car on the highway outside of gina louisiana no telling what really happened with that, but I spoke to his mom, uh, interviewed his beautiful mom, who's in, I believe, in her 90s. So he was like, uh, I guess, uh, he was the youngest of her children. I think he was the one that was 
the last left alive, if I'm not mistaken. But I did an interview with uh, Mike, uh, Marcus Jones, mom. But he was a good brother, man. He was a strong black alpha male or alpha man. But they, the system, the powers of B, wanted to use black women to silence him. Uh, it was unfortunate. And uh, that's the Gen 6 stuff. A lot of folks don't even remember remember the Gen 6 movement, you know. But they sacrificed Brother Marcus. But um, I think that's it for Nightmare. I, we've been on here long enough. Yeah, he was in the back of his friend's truck. They were gathering stuff to feed the homeless. He just came back from New Orleans. He had a chance to see his son, Michael Bell, graduate from Southern University. And from my understanding, of course, his mom and other sources, he just came back from New Orleans. He was trying to feed the homeless in the area. He was going to do a big cook, a cookout, whatever, for the homeless people in the area. So he was gathering supplies. So he was in the back of his friend's truck. And somehow he fell out the back of the truck onto the highway and got ran over by a car. And uh, I heard some things with that situation, talked to his mom and stuff like that. Everything ain't what it appears to be, but it is what it is. What can you do about it? Like I tell people all the time, you know, with Sandra Bland and so many people just dead and gone. I mean, black people, really, we just like, what are we doing, man? We keep on talking this talk. We want to have militias and stuff and showboat and parade. But what are we really doing, man? They always doing stuff to us. We don't defend ourselves. We don't protect ourselves. We don't advocate for ourselves. Like we don't believe in ourselves. So what are we really doing at the end of the day? You understand what I'm saying? Or do you understand what I'm saying? Like, what are we really doing to show that our pain, our suffering is not in vain, that it's worth going through the stuff we have been going through? Something's got to change. Because, you know, this stuff, this living in fertility is ridiculous. This is a tough thing to do. Like, you know, what I do, people don't understand, brother, run I'm by myself most of the time. I'm by myself more doing this stuff. This is like I'm a, a, a lone voice in the wilderness for the most part. And uh, it takes a lot out of you, man, dealing with our people, man. You got to be strong. You got to have a strong uh, constitution dealing with our people. You know, you got to have your mind in a certain place. You got to get focused mentally, physically, and spiritually. To deal with not just our people, but deal with this life thing. It's tough out here for people, man. They're heightening the contradictions. They're making things so extreme that people are checking out of here that normally wouldn't check out of here. So I just want y'all to be kind and loving and um, be reflective towards yourself and forgiving and honest with yourself. I it's just um reading I'm just reading some of the things, but I'm gonna I think I'm gonna check out. Let me read the disclaimer though. <laughs> I'm always reading disclaimer, man. Disclaimer: the views expressed by hosts and guests on the We All Be TV platform are not the official views, opinions, beliefs, or perspectives of We All Be News or the We All Be Group Incorporated. We All Be News is an organization that thoroughly believes in supplementing the information narrative that is usually supplied by the corporate news entities with those viewpoints and expressions which may be marginalized or ignored for a plethora of reasons. We are about informing the general public on alternative perspectives as it relates to news and information and letting the general public be the ultimate judge in deciding on how to use said information. Informed citizens are responsible citizens. Thank you for your support. Thank y'all once again for hanging out with uh, Brother Ron and we all be for almost three hours. This is crazy. Uh, you know, like I said, a lot of times I don't have these things all exactly planned out. It's just freestyling and free-flowing. I feed off you all's energy. I check out what y'all say in the chat. I add, I ad-lib, I improvise, things of that nature. But here we are, almost three hours of a show about our dear brother Patrick Weaver Sr., Want to send uh, amplified blessings and condolences out to his family, loved ones, and friends. Uh, spend, and also, the brother Dimebag, you tell they were very close. They were like brothers, like blood brothers. You could tell the camaraderie, the connection, 
it just like I, I just I, I I feel for the brother Dimebag, you know, but I hope that he can have the courage and strength to and the love to go on, uh, not just for himself or for the memory of his brother, be his brother's keeper, be the legacy keeper of brother Patrick Weaver Sr. Like I said, y'all check out True Power is my YouTube channel. Try to save that information because you know people do things to people's legacy. A lot of times you think your legacies will be your biological children, but really your legacy some come uh can sometimes be the people that you influence and inspire by your example of just being you and giving the best of you to the world and having that being amplified by the folks that receive that message from you. Uh, you being that conduit for something bigger than yourself. So I just want to encourage y'all just to be yourself. Make your authentic contribution by being who you are. Don't be afraid to share who you really are with the rest of the world. And to see what happens. See how the world rewards you or acknowledges you or, or receives you. But then you got to do the first step. You got to believe, love, be kind, be patient, be gentle with yourself. Understand that, you know, that no season lasts forever, that this too shall pass. It's not always raining. It's not always the sun shining, but you have your moments. You have your seasons. Make the most of it. You know, don't give up on yourself now. You came this far, and you still got a long way to go. So I just want to encourage you all, encourage you all, excuse me, to keep the faith, keep it going, and, um, Know that we love you madly. Y'all keep on producing and pushing. But uh, on that note, y'all take care. And I'm closing out because Patrick was a universal soldier. And we're going to send him out the best way we know how. The we all be way. So because we all be in it uh, to win it. So let me set this up. And Brother Patrick, you are gone, but you're not really gone. You're never forgotten. You are a righteous ancestor. We live in our hearts, our minds, and our soul. Brother, we love you madly. Wishing the best for your family. May your seeds grow into powerful, formidable trees of justice, love, peace, and happiness. Thank you, sir. Job well done. Mission accomplished. And this is We All Be. News Free Dixie for the 21st century. God bless everybody.